You are listening to a Galatea audio production of The Half-Blood, Season 1, written by Laura B. L. Nala. He was about to catch me. I couldn't remember how long I'd been running, but there was a burning feeling in my chest. I could hardly breathe. The forest rushed by as I tried to find an escape. The lichen must have been right behind me, because all of a sudden the most incredible smell penetrated my nostrils, causing Neely, my wolf, to howl. In the distance, he howled in response. Mate, she growled. Get yourself together, I snapped back, finally making it out into a clearing. But right beyond the tree line was nothing but a cliff. I looked into the dark, murky depths below. The waves crashed violently against the cliff face. The sea foam fizzled away slowly. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, there he was. He transformed right in front of me. His dark fur became raven black hair. His muscles glistened in the sunlight. The smell was intoxicating. I could barely think. He breathed deeply, his dark eyes gazing intensely into mine. He was waiting for me to say something. I didn't say a single word. I turned and jumped, one week ago. My eyes flew open right as my alarm started ringing. It was that damn dream again. I'd had the same dream every night this month. It was starting to drive me mad. I got out of bed and put aside the thin duvet that covered my body and walked to the kitchen to take some pills. I tried to go back to sleep, but my wolf, Neely, grumbled awake in my head, urging me to get up. I lived in an isolated village in the mortal realm called Crossbreed Land, the only place where half-breeds from all realms live together without problems. My father and mother were not of the same kind. Mom was a she-wolf, while our father was a warlock. Two people from different worlds. Yet fate paired them together. Despite the enmity that exists between the two kingdoms, nothing prevented them from accepting each other. Many years ago, a war broke out between the realm of the witches and the realm of the lichens. No one now knows why the bloody conflict took place, a fact that has been kept secret until now. The few who knew about it were loyal enough to the Lycan king not to spread rumors. Almost 200 years had passed, and the two realms had been coexisting in a civilized manner so far. But the hatred and resentment they had for each other ran deep, especially the Lycans. When our parents met at a fair in Belfast, their instant connection changed everything for them. They couldn't bear to be apart and decided to leave their families and move here. Neither kingdom allowed my parents to live as mates in their territories. No one wanted the half-bloods they would procreate to walk among their own people. It wasn't just the witches and lichens who didn't want half-breeds. The vampires, the fey, and the dragon shifters strictly forbade it. Half-bloods were considered lesser beings. Mom and Dad's flight arrives in an hour, my elder sister Maeve reminded me as I stumbled into the kitchen, still groggy. Our parents have been going back and forth from the lichen realm for years. Mother had always been a teacher of history of the Seven Kingdoms. Though at first the Alpha King did not approve of her staying in the realm with her mate, a few years ago, he had invited her back to teach at one of the pack schools. At least he offered her some kind of apology by inviting her to return to her original home with her warlock mate. I had that dream again, I sighed. Really, again? What happened this time? It was the same place, in a meadow near the forest. I don't know, it's confusing. Was he there? I nodded. There was a bonfire, and people were dancing to that Omnia song you like so much. And then I saw him again through the flames. I felt the same as always, that he was someone I was waiting for all my life to recognize me. Did he approach you this time? Did you see his eyes? No, he just stared at me. But every time I wake up, I cannot remember his face. Do you want me to look into your memories and see if I can find that dream? Maeve put her coffee down on the table. No, this is just a dream. I'm not going to waste my time trying to track down a stranger who may not exist. Maybe you're dreaming about your mate, she said with a shrug. While I was born a werewolf, my sister inherited our father's magic. She was good at manipulating dreams. She could make you remember them, learn things, and control them. I think I've given up. Maybe by now he's given up too. Look, do not ever give up on finding him. 
That man is your other half. Maeve, I'm honestly afraid to meet him. After what happened to you, I felt stupid at that moment when I tried to mention her past. Her gaze turned somber, her expression grave. My situation was different, Nala. Mine was a human, and you know that humans don't feel the bond like us. I am divorced, yes, and I suffered a lot when I discovered he was cheating on me, but I regret nothing. I looked at her, thinking about it. Now can you please let me help you? She asked, exasperated. Fine. I replied, giving in. She was too persuasive when she was in one of her good moods. No one could say no to her. Maybe it was part of her magic. We usually did these rituals in her bedroom. She shut all the blinds and started lighting candles. Red ones when it was a matter of the heart, as she liked to call it. When we were younger, Maeve needed spell books. But now that she had grown up and practiced under the guidance of our father, the spell books were neatly lined up on the big floor-to-ceiling bookshelf. Maeve brought her rose quartz crystal and a few others I did not recognize and arranged them in a circle between us. We sat, eyes closed, facing each other, on a pair of comfy velvet pillows. I never knew what to do during these rituals, so I usually just stayed quiet and let Maeve lead. While I was technically a crossbreed, I had not demonstrated any magical powers, beyond the whole werewolf thing, of course, Maeve took a few deep breaths, rubbed her palms together gently, and placed them on both my temples. She muttered spells under her breath. I could not make out the words. At first, her hands felt cold, but with every whisper that came out of her mouth, her hands got warmer and warmer. It wasn't an uncomfortable warmth, but it did make my skin tingle. It felt like her hands were merging with my head. Then she went quiet. She gave me a small smile and continued. I can feel his power, and even though I can't see his face, he seems quite alive, as if he's been trapped in the same dream as you. What can you see when you try and look at his face? I asked. It's a blur. I can see him standing up, his black shirt and black trousers, his hair as black as a raven. It's hard to see. It's weird. I feel like something is blocking me. Silence filled the moment, leaving us in thought for a few seconds. Suddenly, she snapped back into the room, her arms dropping from my head. While I couldn't see his face, I can say that man looks damn good. Can you imagine if he's your mate? Let me tell you something, my dear, Maeve went on. The sex with your mate is the best thing you'll ever experience in this life. She winked at me. Just then, we heard the front door shut. I perked my wolf ears up, trying to hear better. Mom and Dad! I exclaimed. Maeve and I both ran downstairs to greet our parents. We were met with the warmest embraces. It was nice to have them back. As usual, my sister cooked a delicious meal, and then we went to the terrace for coffee and tea. I wish you could both come with us next time, my mother said. King Alaric's land is beautiful. Everything is so green and fresh. You would love it. So when will you leave again? Maeve asked. Oh, May, we just got here, and you want us to leave so soon? May was the nickname Mom used for my sister. Although she knew Maeve hated it, she still called her that from time to time. Eleanor, I didn't mean it that way, it was just a question. Maeve knew that calling her by her first name would annoy her. Maeve was a little spiteful like that. Well, I think we will be leaving again. Tomorrow, actually. Dad replied, smiling at Mom, who shook her head at Maeve's attitude. So soon, I asked him. Yes, my mother jumped in. Your father and I were invited to a royal ball. We just needed to grab a few things. Any particular reason for this party? I asked after taking a sip of my raspberry tea. Mom shrugged. Just to entertain from what I heard. Nothing special. These lichens do love a good party. That king has no worries at all. He lives in his fine castle, bossing everyone around all day and partying, I said wryly. Hasn't he met his mate yet? My sister cut in. No, not yet, replied dad. There's a rumor going around that he's tired of waiting. Anyway, he hasn't wasted any time, if you know what I mean, my mother pointed out with wide eyes. How old is he? I asked out of curiosity. Well, he looks like he's in his 30s, but nobody really knows what his age is. Did you meet him this time? 
she sighed. Yes, and I can only say that he is an unusual looking man. His character honestly leaves much to be desired. He was not rude to us, my dear, Dad said to her. No, but he wasn't the most polite either. He just greeted us and left, with the excuse that he had urgent matters to attend to. Why don't you girls come with us? Mom, you just said that you two were invited to the ball, not the whole family. My mother sighed again and gently massaged her temple, like she needed all the patience in the world to deal with us, which was typical of her. She was a free spirit and stubborn. She had short blonde hair and green eyes that could frighten even the bravest of men. Nala, what I am trying to say is that both of you can come with us and enjoy all the festivities. Even if you may not be able to attend the ball, you can walk around the city, explore a new place. Do you think the king would have a problem with two half-breeds wandering through his territory? My sister frowned. I can talk to him, but I don't think there should be a problem, Dad replied. Girls, you need some free time to rest. You have been dealing with a lot of work and divorce. Mom looked at my sister with sadness. The idea didn't seem bad at all. I had never been there before. Maybe this was my only chance. I had just finished packing my suitcase when my sister knocked on the door. What's wrong? I asked. When I saw her head poke in, her brow furrowed. I have something to tell you too. I had one of those dreams last night. About what? I asked her as I zipped up my suitcase. About us. About you, Nala. Her words made me pause. Not only could Maeve control dreams, sometimes she could see the future through them, like some kind of premonition. She had also been having recurring dreams recently. And what did you see? I saw you crying, suffering because of someone, and she paused. And what, Maeve? And I had a feeling it was because of your mate. What, are you sure? You know, I'm never 100% sure about these kinds of dreams. She paused and watched my worried expression. You know what? Forget it. Let's just enjoy this trip. Really? After you just told me I'm going to be in pain and crying. She laughed. Okay, we better not worry about this too much, she said. Make sure you get enough beauty sleep. The last thing we need is for you to be crying, suffering, and sleep deprived. You always have the worst circles under your eyes. When she left my room, I lay in my bed staring at the ceiling for a while. I tried not to think about Maeve's dream, but it was hard not to. I shut my eyes, stubbornly pushing the thoughts out of my head. I felt tiredness take over my body, pushing my consciousness away and leaving me in darkness. There I was yet again. Walking in a darkness I knew well, I saw a light coming from a fire in the distance. The smell of burning wood flooded my senses. My body pulsed, drawing me into them. A group of people was dancing around the fire. They sang and smiled as the vaguely familiar music vibrated in the night air. It was a song my sister always sang to me when she was in a good mood. My gaze roamed over each of the faces, which were blurred by the burning light of the flame. Being among them made me feel relaxed, as if I had come home. My legs kept moving forward, the feel of the grass on my skin filled me with anticipation. Then suddenly, I stopped. There he was again. Only this time he seemed to be waiting for me. Nala. His silhouette was a quiet shadow, always around. I had the strange feeling that I had known him all my life. He was a mystery, and I could not look away. His presence possessed a dominant force that drew me to him. As always, whenever I saw him, the black shirt rolled up to his elbows revealed his muscular forearms. His hands were hidden in the pockets of his trousers. Instinctively, I moved closer. I stood right in front of him, the colossal campfire between us. My eyes were unwilling to leave him. The closer we got, the faster my heart pounded against my chest. Just as we were about to touch, the fire went out. I was surrounded by darkness and the sound of my beating heart. The darkness cleared and suddenly I was surrounded by a storm. Black clouds whirled around me. My feet were sinking into something wet and gelatinous. It was mud. Felt something cold pelt my cheek. I looked up to the sky, 
Drop after drop began to fall, an unrelenting downpour drenching me. I started to sink into the mud. Panic shot through my body. The more I struggled, the more I sank. First my ankles, then my knees, my hips, the tips of my fingers. By the time I was shoulder deep in the mud, I realized I was not alone. I heard her before I saw her. A shrill laugh boomed in the air around me. It seemed to resonate in my head. I know who you are, the voice taunted me. A movement just at the periphery of my vision caught my eye. Now, neck deep in mud, paralyzed, I noticed figures were rising from the mud, an army emerging from the depths of the muck. This was not just an army of random soldiers. Vampires, witches, and rogues mingled together. It was bizarre. I had never seen so many different creatures in one place before. That's when I saw her, the silhouette of a female in black at the front of the army. Her body pulsed with an otherworldly energy, but the more I tried to see who she was, the more her face seemed to dilute into the rain. Suddenly, the army launched into battle. I knew I could only do one thing to get away. I had to sink. The last thing I saw before I was submerged into the mud was the biggest beast I had ever seen, running furiously towards my head. Everything went black again. I was swimming in a sticky substance. It seemed alive. Above, I could hear the war raging on, the clanking of weapons, bones being crushed. Only the sounds were muffled, like I was deep underwater. I was safe for now, but I couldn't stay here forever. The mud seemed to be moving my body. Not knowing what else to do, I let it take me. In the distance, there was a small red glow. It seemed I was being pushed in its direction. The closer I got, the bigger the red glow became, until I was close enough to make out its shape. It was the largest ruby I had ever seen, its glow growing and shrinking like a heart beating. I stretched my hand towards it. It was beckoning me to touch it. When my fingers touched its surface, a rush of energy ran through my whole body. I held the ruby above my head and it propelled me upwards through the mud and all the way back to the surface. I was less scared of the devilish creatures and the battle around me. I was safely enveloped in the gem's warm glow. It seemed to be protecting me from the hundreds of vampires, witches, and rogues in front of me. Even the rain seemed to slide off my body without a trace. A bolt of electric blue lightning seemed to strike me, but instead of hurting me, it turned into a cool golden mist. My eyes went up to the sky. The dark blue of the storm had turned to black, with thick, shimmering silver clouds moving in a circular pattern. Lightning was coming from its core, and while I wasn't scared because I had the ruby in my hands, I knew that this was magic, was a dark, black magic. The woman dressed in black wielded a ruby-encrusted dagger, ruthlessly eliminating anyone who dared cross her path. She left a glimmering black smoke in her path. The beast seemed to be running right at her. Oh, my dear, her voice was overtly feminine. It is a pity it has come to this. The lichen roared in response, and she did nothing but laugh again, her dagger dancing in her fingers. The woman lunged at him, the tip of her dagger pointing at his heart. However, he was as quick as she was, dodging her just in time, using his claws to lethally injure her. I didn't understand who was really good and who was bad, but from the way she was talking, it seemed that the real enemy was the army of vampires, rogues, and witches. I wanted to know their story. How had it come to this? Was all this her form of revenge? Or perhaps the beast was the true victim? Dozens of possibilities crossed my mind in those few seconds. The beast roared. He had her at his mercy, his body towering over hers. She dropped her dagger into the mud. I wanted to help someone, but I didn't know who. My eyes focused on the beast as he growled low, bringing his nose up to the woman's face. It looked as if he was smelling her. I thought I saw a gray glint in his eyes and the hesitation in them deciding whether to spare her life or not. Another emotion overwhelmed me completely. It was a feeling I did not expect in the middle of a place full of blood and death. I felt envious in that instant. I wished he looked at me like that, full of love and pain. I wanted it all, everything about this figure. 
but he raised his arm and buried his claw in her chest with one swift, deadly motion. Her body went limp in his arms. She was dead. Sadness gripped my heart, an emotion that I recognized as mine alone. For her, I did not understand it. I stood there petrified, watching as a howl full of pain and anguish came from him. Slowly, the battle died down as the screams faded, leaving only the beast standing. All of a sudden, the beast looked up right at me. It was like he was staring right into my soul. He started to wade through the mud towards me, his muscles flexed with every step he took. Trying to shield myself from him, I held up the ruby. In the light of the gem, his fur and claws were gone. He was a man, a lichen. His voice surprised me. You're finally here, he said. I've been waiting for you. King Alaric. Her lips were on my body, leaving warm kisses on my chest and following all the way to my hard member. I was excited by every move. Her hands now caressed my member, playing with it. Her dark hair brushed my skin, and her brown eyes looked at me with a smile. I felt her warm mouth, and I gasped at the feeling she was giving me. Ever since I'd started dating her, she'd been trying to please me in every way, a little overwhelming at times. I drowned in the feeling of the tongue licking and sucking, stopping it before I could come inside her mouth. I grabbed her waist and laid her on the bed underneath me. Her hands were pulling my hair fiercely while I was kissing her hard. I bit her lip. I was hungry for her mouth. Those blue eyes were my downfall. Her lips were so soft and always demanding. Wait, blue eyes? I opened my eyes and found Sala looking at me with her brown eyes, waiting for me to continue. I started again, savoring her lips, trying to focus. But every time I closed my eyes, I saw only blue eyes instead of the brown ones that now looked at me worriedly. What is going on? Are you okay, my love? Sala asked me. I looked at her. Yes, I don't know. I think I'm tired. Oh, she said with a little disappointment on her face. Is something bothering you? Sala asked me again. No, I think I'm tired from all the work I've been doing lately. I lied to her. I wanted to say yes, that something or someone was haunting my mind. I did not know what was happening to me. I'd only seen the woman with the blue eyes twice in my entire life and only in dreams, the way that mysterious woman made me feel with those blue eyes. I'd do anything for her. I'd give my life for those eyes. I exhaled deeply. This is crazy. I didn't know her. I couldn't remember her face, only her eyes. I saw her last night. It was the second time, and this time it was different. She was dancing around the fire with her white dress pulled up to her knees. Her hair was flying around her. I couldn't tell if the color was red or blonde. She was hypnotizing. She stopped dancing when she felt my eyes on her. The light of the fire prevented me from seeing her face clearly. Who was she? Was she real? Maybe I'm delusional. There was a time when I dreamed of finding my match. I would think for hours about what my fated mate looked like, her hair color, her eyes. I would daydream about her. Then she would come along. Many nights I spent dreaming of her arrival, my true mate. I didn't care who she was, because I wouldn't choose her, even if she was the most beautiful woman in the world. I remembered how Hado used to make fun of my judgment saying that once my real mate showed up, I wouldn't be able to help it, the instinct to claim her and protect her. I looked at Sala with her eyes closed and her head on my shoulder. Sala was stunning. She had the beauty that every man could wish for in a woman. And yet... Nala. Finally, we arrived at King Alaric's kingdom, located in the area known to mortals as Denmark. Each territory was hidden from the eyes of ordinary humans. While witches, fairies, werewolves, vampires, and goblins could live among humans undetected, many of these creatures preferred to live within their realms, as they would not have constant pressure to hide from people who would never understand such powers. The realms were parallel worlds to the human world. Only non-humans could cross the boundaries between them. 
My species lived in packs scattered all over the human world and, of course, here in the kingdom. Every pack had an alpha, a beta, and an omega. Each one must respect the limits of their own territories, in theory at least, as the need for power and domination led many of them to fight for land in the past. We stayed in a small, quaint hotel near the city. The weather was perfect, sunny, and the breeze was slightly cold. The streets were lined with brick buildings full of shops. The colors were so vivid I felt like I was in a storybook. The bars and restaurants had little tables outside for those who chose to eat or drink in the sunlight. As I walked on the pavement, I saw a tavern with a Viking helmet hanging above the entrance. Einar's Viking Bar. The place seemed fine. I thought it might be fun to go out there with Maeve tonight. The city wasn't noisy, people were just walking around. It was a quiet, charming town. I was drawn to the smell of roasted coffee beans. I saw a small cafe with a dark blue exterior and white window frames. I decided to go in for a cup of coffee. A mature looking woman guided me to a table. Hello, welcome to Cafe Rosalind. Would you like some water to start with? The waiter was a young man who looked my age. He was thin and had green eyes and blonde hair tied back in a tiny top knot. He was somewhat different from the other werewolves in the area. They were all usually robust and full-bodied, but the waiter was not. No thanks, I'll have an iced coffee, I replied with a smile. Cold coffee? You strike me as the hot type, he winked at me. I'll be right back. It was past 3 p.m., and the coffee house didn't have much clientele. Maybe this wasn't the busiest hour. After a few minutes, the coquettish waiter brought me my coffee. Here you go, he said. Thank you. You're not from around here, are you? No, I'm not. Now I have to start a conversation when I just want to drink my coffee in peace. Why are you visiting if you don't mind my asking? The young man now leaned on my table in a relaxed way, a little sassy. I came to visit the kingdom, I told him. It's actually my first time here. I didn't want to be rude, but I also didn't want to encourage him. Wow, I've never met anyone who had never been to Alaric's kingdom. I was surprised by the informal tone with which he addressed his alpha. Alaric, is that what people are calling him here or just you? I asked him, playing dumb. He laughed. That's what I call him. Oh, I see, I said, trying to cut the conversation short and get him to leave, but he didn't notice it and carried on. There's this event coming up in a few days, a sort of game, if you will. You should try and come. It's going to be amazing, he suggested. All right, maybe I'll pass by. Well, all right, I've already taken up too much of your time. Enjoy your coffee and I'll see you there. I responded with a grimace. When I finished my coffee, it was already after 4 p.m. I had to go to the hotel quickly because Mother and Maeve would surely be back from the hairdressers. Once at the hotel, I helped Mom put her dress and jewelry on. She looked fantastic, like a real queen. Okay, girls, I hope you have some fun of your own. She blew kisses as her and Dad got into the cab. When they left, I looked over at Maeve and said, We need to get some drinks. Let's change into something pretty and get out of this hotel. Nala, when will you let me go for a run? My wolf spoke to me in my mind. She was feeling restless. Tomorrow night, okay? I promised her. I felt her hiding back in my mind. Maeve got out of the bathroom with a pair of gray jeans and a white silk blouse with a V-neck, with a bit of makeup and her loose curls reaching her chest. My sister had the face of a nymph, with big green eyes and long, wavy, dark blonde hair. She was as knowledgeable and educated as our mother. Are you leaving dressed like that? She asked. What's wrong with my outfit? You look like a black widow. I looked at myself in the mirror. I was wearing a pair of black jeans, a black silk tank top, a black leather jacket, and black heels. Black widow? I really don't care, I sighed. I just want to relax, I said, grabbing my purse and key. We were drinking in the tavern I'd seen this afternoon. It was crowded. I was watching a group of huge local men drinking beer from a horn. They all looked like real Vikings, all muscles. I noticed that one of them was eyeing my sister. That guy is looking at you, sis. Maeve glanced at him and turned her head to spit all the beer in my face. 
She was laughing so hard that I could see small tears in the corners of her eyes. Seeing her like that, I couldn't help but laugh too. She was trying to say something to me. Oh my, oh mum, oh Nala, did you, did you see him? Yes, he has, he has a little braid on his chin. The only thing he's missing is an ax. The Viking realized that we were laughing, and with a grave expression, he came to our table. Good evening, he said with a severe face. I was trying to put on a poker face, but my sister was not helping me. Good evening, I replied. I could not help noticing that you are not from around here, the Viking said. That is correct, I told him. We are not from here. What are you laughing at, witch? Maeve stopped and looked at him more seriously now. Werewolves could smell witches, since they had a different scent. I'd never really known what that scent was, because I couldn't smell it, but at least I could recognize a witch. I didn't know why, but I could. It was my intuition. That's none of your concern, Maeve replied with a firm voice, but her eyes were just the opposite. I could tell she was a little worried, scared even. What are you going to do? She taunted. By the way, you have ketchup on your chin braid. The three of us stared at each other, and suddenly Maeve and I started to laugh out loud again. I will make sure that your kind never enters this kingdom again. When he got up to get closer to us, he tripped on nothing and fell right on his face. Everyone in the bar laughed and Maeve stood tall, proud of what she had done. Suddenly, Maeve was quiet, the way she was when she was reading someone's mind. I could tell from her eyes that she was sifting through the Viking's thoughts. She was clearly worried about something because the next thing I knew she was dragging me out of the bar. Sorry, she said, still eyeing the front door of the bar to make sure he was not following us. We had to get out of there. That man was about to get angry. What did you see? I'd rather not tell you, she answered. That man needs to go to anger management or something. So what now? It can't be the end of the night. How boring. Well, I do have an idea, she started. But first, we're going to need to change into something a little more ball-worthy. Maeve had a mischievous look on her face, and for once, I didn't mind. Nala. Eleanor and Daria Dollar, said Maeve to guard by the gate. Although she might be under Darius Dollar, everyone always gets her name wrong. She batted her eyelashes at him innocently. The man scanned the list. His face lit up when he found out parents' names. Ah, uh, yes, he said. I see you two here. And yes, she's under Darius. Happens every time, I responded, rolling my eyes like this had happened a million times before. He opened the large golden gates, letting us through. There was a long road lit by glimmering golden lanterns. I felt like I was in a fairy tale. Luckily, Mom had brought along two extra dresses, just in case she changed her mind at the last minute, otherwise we would have stuck out like sore thumbs. I was wearing a silky floor-length purple dress. It made my blue eyes pop. Meanwhile, Maeve chose the emerald chiffon green one. We both looked mystical. At the end of the road, we reached a courtyard. At the center of the courtyard was a fountain with a large statue at the very center. I examined the figures made of marble. It was a group of lichens, perfectly chiseled. It seemed to be a dead end. We were surrounded by hedges and tall trees with twinkly lights in them. What do we do now? Asked Maeve, examining the area, looking for clues. I think you might need my help, whispered my wolf in my mind. What do you mean? I can open the gate. Okay, then please do, but only on one condition. Let me guess, I said. We have to go on a run soon. You know me so well. We are one silly, of course I know you. I have finally come home, let me in, almighty Lycan Castle. As soon as my wolf uttered those words, the hedges and trees all around us started to retreat, revealing the most magnificent palace I had ever seen. That wasn't me said Maeve, perplexed. Yeah, I know, I said, still shocked. It was my wolf. The outside of the castle was reddish-brown, medieval style, surrounded by a glimmering moat. You could see a bridge being used as an entrance to the fortress. When we went in, I realized that even though this fortress had been built a long time ago, it had been modernized. 
From the ceiling hung luxurious electric chandeliers adorned with numerous glass pendants. The walls of the corridors were decorated with beautiful paintings from the Renaissance period. I could hear a lovely song playing in the ballroom. It echoed through the hallways. Maeve and I both walked into the ballroom. I could feel people's eyes on us as we made our way through the crowd. Like magic, we suddenly had champagne flutes in our hands. And to think we were going to spend the night at that gross bar, Maeve whispered into my ear. Everyone seemed to be watching a couple dancing in the middle of the ballroom. My eyes were glued on him. His robust figure moved with such grace. I barely noticed the woman he was dancing with. I was so distracted by his presence that I bumped into someone in front of me. Nala? Maeve? It was my mother, confused why we were there. Are those my dresses? Girls, my dad jumped in, equally confused. What on earth are you doing here? Aren't you happy to see us? Maeve replied. Of course we are, sweetheart, my mother hugged us both. We were just not expecting this. Look over there. That is King Alaric and his new girlfriend. I must say, if I were any younger, I would try to steal him away from her right away. He is handsome, I said in a daze, isn't he? I wish you would both find a match like him. I've heard from some ladies that he used to be a womanizer, but for a few months now he's been going out with only this girl. I watched them dance. My body was flooded with a million emotions all at once. It was almost like I was being pulled towards him by an invisible force. I couldn't breathe. I have to get out of here, I said to my family before running out of the ballroom. King Alaric. My love, why don't you ask me to dance? I took her by the hand and guided her to the center of the ballroom. This was precisely what I'd wanted to avoid. All these people now thought that Sala could be their future Luna. As a courtesy, I agreed to dance with her this time, but I made a mental note that I would leave the room the next time before any dance started. The opening should have been done by the Alpha King and the Alpha Queen. Sala was neither. When the music started, we began moving. With my left hand, I grabbed Sala's right hand, and with the other, her narrow waist. I couldn't deny that Sala was beautiful tonight. Her dress, which highlighted her breasts, was golden, fitted to her body. Trying not to look bored, I looked around at the guests without paying attention to any of the faces looking at us. I saw one of my advisors in the corner of the room, but it was not really he who caught my attention, but the woman who stood behind him. My heart suddenly jumped when I saw those blue eyes I knew so well. I tried to lead our dance in her direction so I could get a better good look at her face. I broke my gaze when Sala distracted me, asking something. I nodded and smiled at her, trying to show interest. When I looked back to where the strange woman was supposed to be, all I saw was the wall. My councilman was still there, but she was gone. I scanned the whole hall, feeling frustrated. Was she real? She seemed too real to me now, those blue eyes looking at me. I could not have been hallucinating. Was I losing my mind? I wondered again. Maybe it wasn't her, or maybe it was just a woman with blue eyes. There were many of those around. The song ended, and I led Sala out of the center of the ballroom. What is going on? Hado, my beta, asked me, feeling that something was disturbing me. Nothing, I replied without any desire to start a conversation. My love, I heard Sala's voice. As much as I liked her, it irritated me to hear her call me my love, especially in front of everyone. Lately, I'd noticed that she was overconfident in our relationship, like she was sure she was my mate. I liked her, yes, but she was not my wife, yet alone my queen. When will the hunt be? She asked me. In two days, I said. Is everything ready? Yes. This year, the event will take place just outside the castle grounds. Everything has been arranged accordingly, Hado replied. How many people are playing this time? About 14, I said. I hated that damn game. How come those women like to participate? Every year I could only thank the moon goddess that none of them were my mate. The vision of blue eyes came back to me. I didn't know why, but every time I saw the mysterious woman in my dreams, I felt weak, as if just looking at her had drained my strength. This was not a typical dream. This one was different. I felt this one in my flesh, like she was right in front of me, dancing with her dress in her hands. 
How was it possible that I only remembered the color of her eyes and not the rest of her face? I sighed in frustration. I shouldn't be thinking about this nonsense. I should be concentrating on the whole debacle unfolding in the kingdom of witches. Apparently, Evanora, the witch queen, was scared of something. No one knew what it could be, but her subjects had noticed her paranoid behavior. Which was strange, considering how powerful she was. I would have to send Darius to go to her. They had stopped communicating after he married Eleanor, but this was too important. We would all have to set our differences aside. Darius was the only person she trusted. I couldn't risk endangering my kingdom like last time. My protective senses were heightened more than ever before, almost like I had more to protect. Even with all this happening and my duty to my kingdom, I needed to find the woman with the blue eyes. Those eyes I yearned for so badly that I was pretty sure I was hallucinating them in the faces of strangers. Nala. Nala, Nala, I heard her again. The voice that was calling me was like the sirens singing at sea to attract the sailors. It was a voice that made me want to please her. I was trying to open my eyes, but I felt as if my eyelids were heavy. In one last attempt, I finally made it. I found myself lying on the grass-covered ground. It was dark. I sat down to take a look around. What was this place? In front of me, I saw a small lake surrounded by huge trees. A silvery rising moon shone in a cloudless sky. Who called me? Nala, here, come, darling. I turned around and saw her. She was standing near the entrance to the forest with a cold expression. I couldn't help but feel nervous. Her long white hair covered her cheeks, and her eyes that now looked at me were a deep black. The more I looked at her, the more I was convinced she had a dark aura. Who are you? I asked her. Nala, my sweet Nala, I have been waiting for you, she said in a melodic voice. Waiting for me for what? You will find out soon, my Nala. My Nala, I repeated skeptically. The way she'd called me was as if she had known me all my life. Nala, she called me again. Why did you do it? What are you talking about? I frowned. The necklace, Nala. You shouldn't have taken it. I didn't know what to say. How did this woman know about the necklace? Only Maeve and I knew about it. Why do you care? My voice sounded challenging now. Oh, but I do, Nala. She paused and then continued, saying, You know that no one can escape their destiny. Sooner or later, your dreams will come for you. I would say sooner rather than later, my Nala. She called my name possessively. She disappeared. I turned to my left, hearing something. As I got closer, I noticed that the noise came from people singing and the sound of a tambourine. When I went out of the forest's darkness, I saw that I was in that dream again. There they were, the same people singing and dancing around the fire. However, I felt that something was different this time. My feet moved cautiously among them. I was like a hawk waiting for its prey. For the first time, I felt scared in the same dream that had haunted me for so many nights. I looked at the faces of those around me, then I fixed my eyes on that person. Is this your dream, Nala? Who are you? Show me, Nala. Show me the man you've been dreaming of said the same woman I'd seen at the lake, ignoring my question. The light from the fire helped me see her quite clearly. She was dressed in a black evening gown with elegant, transparent layers. The dress revealed her long, snow-white arms. They were so white that you could see the lines of her blue veins. I've never dreamed of any man. I tried to sound confident. The woman grinned, but her smile never reached those black eyes. There was something about her that made me feel wary. Are you sure, Nala? She looked to her right, and when I followed her gaze, I saw him, the stranger. He seemed unaware of what was happening around him. She approached him, inspecting him. The woman looked at me again, and her lips formed a smile. Now do you know who I'm talking about? Her fingers were caressing his cheeks. He's beautiful, isn't he? She wasn't upset by my apparent ignorance. She was calm, as if she had all the time in the world for me to confess. 
I don't know who he is. I told her the truth. You will see you soon, my Nala. And she vanished. The stranger was gone too. I just stood there watching the fire. The heat from the fire was getting more intense. My palms were sweating now. I looked at my hands and saw small burns appear on my skin. A horrible pain shocked me. My hands were burning from the inside. Help me, please, someone, I screamed. Nobody paid attention to me. I kept shouting for help. Help me! Nala, Nala, wake up, Nala. You are having a nightmare. Wake up, now! I heard Neely screaming in my mind. I opened my eyes and quickly sat in my bed. I was short of breath, and I tried to calm down. Are you all right? Neely asked, worried. Yes, I am fine. I had a horrible nightmare. What happened? I was dreaming about someone who knew me and said that she would come back for me. I don't know, Neely. I felt my hands burning and then my whole body. I was trying to explain, but I couldn't finish the sentence. Well, don't worry. It was just a dream. Try to sleep again. I didn't say anything to her because I felt it wasn't just a dream. I was almost convinced this woman had manipulated it. How could she have done that? The only person I knew who could do that was my sister. If my assumptions were correct, it meant the woman was definitely a powerful witch. Let's go for a run. What now? It is still dark outside. I don't want to go back to sleep. I just need to get out of here. Do not worry. In less than an hour, it will be dawn. Neely agreed with me. I put on black tights, a long white shirt, and black sneakers. I walked until I reached the edge of a small forest that was two miles from the hotel. I closed my eyes and let Neely take over. I felt my human bones breaking. I tried not to scream in pain. No matter how many times I changed, the process always hurt. It was impossible to get used to the suffering of broken bones. Once in my wolf form, Neely stretched out, shook her body, and started running. The thick forest was full of ferns and wildflowers. The smell of spring was so relaxing, and with my wolf in control, I felt free and wild. After a few minutes of running, I noticed the sun's first rays trying to reach the giant trees. The sound of the branches caught my attention. For a few seconds, I waited to see what it was. A brown rabbit came into view. We lurked in silence, trying not to alert it. In a surprise attack, I jumped on it and held my prey on the ground with my front claws and bit its neck. After eating, I lay down among the plants and flowers that grew abundantly in the field. The nature around me was beautiful, and the sound of the birds and the smell of the morning dew made me feel peaceful. I decided to return a little later to the place where I'd left my clothes to change back and go back to the hotel to shower. When I finished dressing in the clothes I had left under the tree at the entrance to the woods, I noticed a pair of eyes looking at me. I turned to the right, and a werewolf with a light orange coat and white spots stared at me for a few more seconds and then disappeared into the forest. For a moment, my body was tense with apprehension, but I was able to relax a little when I saw the werewolf moving in another direction. I couldn't help but feel watched. Nala I got to the hotel and took a shower and put on something else. I was in a good mood. As I was putting on a beige cotton dress with earthy colored shoes, I thought that I needed to talk to my sister about last night. Maybe she could give me some answers. I fixed my hair in a high ponytail, put on some makeup, and went to my sister's room. I knocked twice before Maeve opened the door. Why are you awake so early? She said, yawning. What time is it? I think almost nine. I said while I went inside, and she went to lie down again. Wake up. We need to do something. I will get you breakfast. You need to wash your face, change your clothes, and come with me. I sat next to her. What is going on? She sensed something was not right. This witch could sometimes feel my deepest emotions. Even if I were in a good mood, she could sense something was bothering me. I had a dream last night. The same as always? She asked me in a dozy, low voice with her forearm covering her eyes. Kind of. This one was different. I paused. I found myself near a lake. It was dark, and a woman was calling my name. How did she look? She said without changing her posture. She had white hair, black eyes. She didn't look any older than you. Her skin was as white as milk, I recalled. 
Did she say something? She uncovered her eyes to look at me. Yes, she asked me why I took the necklace. Her eyes widened. Are you talking about the one I gave you the night before coming here? Yes, she knew. I don't know how, but she said I cannot escape my destiny, and then she disappeared. After that, I remember that I was walking in a forest because I heard something. I found the same people dancing around the fire, and then I saw her again. She asked me to show her that man. What? Her voice sounded a little nervous. Maeve, I think she was manipulating my dream, because after she asked me, I saw him next to her. I told her I didn't know him, and she told me that I would soon. After that, my wolf woke me up because I was screaming. I felt my hands and body burn inside, I finished frantically. Calm down, Nala, Maeve tried to appease me. Let me get into your memory so I can have a clear picture of who she is. I closed my eyes trying to relax. I could feel the pressure in my mind. Maeve was now inside. Is this the place? Maeve asked. Yes, we were now walking around the lake. She was there. I pointed to where I'd seen the woman, but she was not here to view. I guided my sister to where the campfire had been. Here I was. I pointed to the spot. Okay, let's see if we can find her. We looked closely at our surroundings. I felt Maeve's hand hold tightly to my wrist. As I felt her grip, I looked at her and saw her looking at something. She was shaking with fear. I moved my gaze to where hers was. A flash, a scream, the black eyes. Maeve's scream was so loud I could barely stand it. When I broke free from her spell, I found her screaming with her hands covering her eyes. It looked like it hurt. Maeve, Maeve! I was trying to calm her. I took her hands so I could see her eyes. Are you hurt? Maeve slowly opened her eyes, trying to focus on my figure. Maeve? Nala, what happened? I saw her, I mean, I think I saw her. Nala, that entity kicked me out of your mind. It was dark magic. She is definitely a witch and a bad one, she said in a frenetic way, still rubbing her eyes. Shit, it was the only word that managed to get out of my mouth. But what could a witch like her want with me? Listen, she started, grabbing my shoulders. If she mentioned the necklace to you, it is because in some way your mate is connected to her. This dark magic is after you. We need to talk to dad. My mind was blank. No, not now. I will talk to dad as soon as we return home. Nala, that's not a smart move. Father can help us find the truth behind your dreams. Maeve, I'll talk to him soon. I don't think anything bad is gonna happen right now. I have the necklace all the time. She sighed and rolled her eyes at me and left me sitting there on her bed. At first, I'd felt guilty about using the necklace. I was trying to hide from my mate. When my sister had come to my bedroom that night, saying that she had dreamed of me and that she'd seen me in pain because I would probably find my mate, I'd gotten scared. She'd noticed it and had said it might not happen, but I hadn't wanted to risk it. A few nights ago, can you mask my scent? I asked her. Are you crazy, Nala? I won't do it. Please, I begged her. May, I don't want to meet him yet. I breathed deeply. That's not true. I mean, I lowered my head, with my hands covering my eyes. I mean, I want to meet my mate, but I am not ready yet. Not after you just said, Nala, you know that my dreams have not always come true, she said, interrupting my sentence. I don't care. May, please just, just help me. She sighed. Okay, I will help you. Do you have anything you can keep with you all the time? I gave her the necklace that mother had given me for my last birthday. It was simple and discreet. Won't it break when you turn into a wolf? No, it is long enough not to break in the turning process. Okay, I'm going to take it now. I have to look in my books for the spell to mask the smells. I can't remember all the verses now. The only thing I need you to know is this, and listen carefully. Once you start wearing this necklace, neither you nor he will be able to smell each other. Even if you look into each other's eyes, you won't recognize each other as mates. Once you take off the necklace, the spell will be broken, even if you put it back on. It won't work anymore. I will take it. I felt like a coward doing this 
but I was terrified at the thought of suffering for something or someone, especially after having seen my sister betrayed by her mate. When she'd found out, he'd treated her so indifferently that it had made her feel worse. My sister had gone without food for days, barely slept, and cried in her bed every night. There were no words to cheer her up. She had a broken soul. Over time, she resumed her routine, but walked with an absent expression. Even if someone made a joke, she laughed without the smile reaching her eyes. Not even our father could help her feel better. When your soul is broken, you are never the same again. And my sister was never the same. Nala. We were walking in the street market. I'd made Maeve promise not to tell dad about the dream for now. I knew he was very protective of us. If he found out there was someone with black magic stalking my mind, he would take us to America without a second thought. And as worrying as the situation was, deep down, I wanted to stay for a few more days. It was a sunny day. The area was full of street vendors selling clothes, shoes, medieval weapons, beer horns, Viking helmets, and of course, food and drink. The delicious smell of roast meat in the air made my mouth water. I inhaled deeply, trying to concentrate on the source of the food's exquisite aroma. One of the vendors was roasting a piglet in the blazing heat of a wood fire. I wanted to get close to it to taste the delicious delicacy that my eyes were already devouring. But my mother, demanding my attention, grabbed my arm to take me to a small medieval clothing stand. Nala, Maeve, check out these dresses. My mother was holding some weird medieval-style clothing. We will need to buy some costumes for tomorrow. Where will we go tomorrow? Maeve didn't seem happy with the idea of wearing that. Tomorrow, we will be going to the annual event of this kingdom, my mom said, as she put a long-sleeved black tunic and a pair of pants in front of Dad, trying to see if they would fit him. Why do we need costumes? May asked holding an ankle-length blue linen apron with a white underdress. It is a tradition that every year, the event should be dedicated to all our warrior ancestors. This year is dedicated to the Vikings. Nala, take this one. I bet you it would look great on you. My sister smirked and gave me the most horrible garment I had ever seen. The red dress was short, and the shoulder straps were fastened to a white underdress with two brooches made of bronze. I will not wear that. I returned the dress to my mother. Yes, you will, she remarked, and went to the next store for shoes. So why do we have to go again? I sighed, feeling bored already. We had been here for almost three hours. The event is held every year for the amusement of the Pax. Everyone will be there, my dad mentioned. Are you sure I can go? I am a witch, and you know how people here feel about it. Maeve was worried now. Of course you can, May. The King's Beta knows about us. He allowed us to come. I watched my dad deciding about a pair of brown ankle-high boots with buttons. After checking them, he put the shoes back on the shelf. So what do you do at the fair? I asked. Well, you know, eating, wrestling, dancing, good stuff. The main attraction of it is the hunt, my mom replied. The hunt? Yes, it is a game of men hunting women. She who succeeds in being caught must spend one night with her captor, my mom continued. Are you for real? I asked in disbelief. Nala, hunting has traditionally been werewolves hunting women. Whoever was captured would become a sort of sexual slave to her captor for life. This was a centuries-old tradition until the current Alpha King decided to eliminate it, but he could not do so completely. Why not? When he decided to do it, almost all the packs and most of his councilmen complained about it. He spent months trying to reach an agreement, and what he was able to change was the part about becoming a sex slave for a lifetime, and it became about spending a night. Plus, he imposed a limit on participants, and they would only be volunteers. What a king! He's a wimp! Are you sure he's the alpha of alphas? If it were up to me, I'd take the law down, period. I've always thought the Alpha King would be someone with absolute power and dominance who could do whatever he wanted. Nala, the Alpha King is mighty, but there are things he must give up sometimes. He is the protector and leader of all the packs. 
He has the responsibility to care for them and listen to their demands, my mother said. I understand what you're saying, mother, but what I can't understand is how anyone can allow themselves to be played. Nala, the players are volunteers, she repeated. How can anyone consent to that? Maybe it's the thrill of the hunt, being chased, and being able to escape your captor. Many women participate to prove they are better than the males. This world is upside down. We arrived at the hotel with a bunch of dresses and shoes. The worst part of all of this was that we would have to live for two nights like authentic Vikings. We would sleep in tents and shit in holes. What a nightmare. The driver drove like 45 minutes before reaching our destination. The event was held in a field covered with young green grass. In the distance, I could see the entrance to a dense forest. There was an ocean of white tents here, and, of course, hundreds of werewolves. From the breeze I felt, I noticed that we were not far from the sea. We were in the middle of nowhere. Mother was wearing the same style dress as us, but her underdress was dark blue, the apron was green with patterns, and a leather handbag hung from her belt. She had her hair tied up in a kerchief knotted at the nape of her neck. Dad, on the other hand, was wearing a black tunic with his handbag tied to his belt, white pants, and brown boots. Maeve and I felt really ridiculous in these dresses. She was wearing that dress she'd first seen yesterday in the street market, and I was wearing a dark green underdress. The apron that covered the underdress was dark red. Our outfits didn't have any pockets, which was why we were wearing belts with little handbags. My hair was styled in a waterfall braid. We were approached by the same old man who'd received us at the castle on the night of the ball. He looked like a clown with that multicolor tunic. With a wrinkled expression and always so severe, he guided us to our tents. Maeve and I would be sleeping together, next to our parents. The tents were sturdy and of stable construction. The white tarpaulins were made of pure cotton and were waterproof. They were in the shape of a pyramid with a quadrilateral base, supported by wooden poles that were secured to the tarps by ropes. At least we had enough space to walk around inside, and we would sleep in the grass. Let's go for a walk, sister. I am starving, I said as I was going outside the tent. Do you think they will have normal food here? I don't know, Maeve. From what I'm seeing, these people are serious about living like Vikings, most likely we'll sit down to eat with one of these dirty food-spitting guys. Ugh, gross. Look, that must be the royal tent. The tent had the same basic construction as the rest, and the canvas was just as white, only in this case it was much more significant. At least six people could fit inside. Do you think the king will be there? Maybe, I said thoughtfully. I felt a strange sensation, as if something was there, waiting to be revealed. Let's find something to eat. Where are you going, witch? Uh, not you again. It was the Viking from the bar. He looked ready to kill. He had a bald head and a full, long beard. The braid on his chin was gone. His face was dirty, as if he had wiped it off with his muddy hand. Behind that dirt were the bluest eyes I'd ever seen. What do you want? He ignored me, shifting his gaze from me to my sister. Don't you expect I will forget what you did in the bar, witch? You will pay for that. Kavan never forgets. Now he sounded like a caveman. Well, tell Kavan that I don't care, Maeve mocked. Leave us alone. You were the one who came to us and disrespected my sister, so back off. I don't take orders from you, dog. Dog? Do you want me to show you how hard a dog can bite? Nala. Let's go. It's not worth arguing with this asshole. We'd been wandering around the grounds all afternoon. Although I felt a little uncomfortable in a rustic place like this, without the comfort of a good bed, without the TV, and without an air-conditioned room, I could not deny that the experience was not a bad one. The food was great, and there was more than enough to drink. Sometimes we could talk with other people, but other times, some of them didn't like us. They would just ignore us or leave the site. I lay down on the floor of our tent late at night. Luckily, I had a kind of wool pillow to rest my head. My mind began to travel through the memories of the black-eyed, white-haired witch. How had she gotten into my dreams? Where did she know me from? How did she know about my recurrent dreams about that stranger? 
Was that stranger my mate? And if so, what would be his relationship with that woman? I sighed, having exhausted myself. So many questions and no answers. I felt anxious and tossed and turned, trying to get some sleep. I decided to get out of the tent and walk around for a while to calm my mind. There were hardly any people still awake in the common areas. I could see some with beer mugs and others with mead in hand. Wandering, I entered a part of the forest with my hundreds of questions and hundreds of non-answers. I ended up at a pond. Small waterfalls fell on small reservoirs, and rocks surrounded it, creating a space that inspired a fairy tale. Unable to resist the urge to taste the water, I stripped naked and entered into the water. The cold temperature of the water jolted my body for an instant. I was floating on the water, enjoying the peace and staring at the stars that decorated the eternal sky. My concerns were transfigured into the calm and ecstasy I was experiencing with the stillness of the night and the small glimmers of light from the waxing moon covering the surface. Suddenly, my head hit something sturdy. I stood up and turned around, and instead of finding a rock, I found a broad, muscular back and massive arms. Nervously, I began to instinctively walk away. Who the fuck are you? Something changed and took away the feeling of nervousness at hearing the rage in his voice. Who the fuck am I? Who the fuck did he think he was talking to me like that? So with the same anger, I answered him. Turning to face him, I said, who the fuck are you? Incredulity replaced my anger. The man in front of me was him, the stranger who had been shadowing me in my sleep. My heart raced for some reason. He was surreal. The stranger in my dreams had always presented himself elegantly dressed, with short black hair and blue eyes. In front of me, this beast had long locks of black hair that fell freely over his shoulders, making his blue eyes more prominent. Despite the lack of clarity, I knew it was him. Could it be him? A squeamish doubt took hold of my being. Nala. I was here first. The stranger had a harsh and indifferent expression. Well, I can't know for sure. Since I've been here, I haven't seen you until now. You could be one of the perverts from the camp who followed me, saw me undress and entered the water, seizing the opportunity. His expression became even colder and more labored. His eyes went over my face and down to my body. The darkness of the water at night prevented my breasts from being seen, so I didn't think it was necessary to cover my breasts with my arms. Do you enjoy what you're seeing? I asked him, with a boldness I hardly recognized in myself. The proximity of this beast was overwhelming, and I should have felt intimidated instead of trying to intimidate him. A scornful smile grew on his face. This man was no ordinary man. Dominance and power were the sensations that radiated from his body, like the wild waves of a raging ocean crashing against stone barriers, demanding passage. On the contrary, looking at you, you're not beautiful enough to tempt me. And besides, witches are not my type. With his arrogance, he climbed out of the pond and disappeared. But what the hell? How fucking dumb was I? This asshole drops that on me, and instead of answering him with something smarter, I stay silent like an idiot? Witch? I'm not a witch. I'm a werewolf. I swear to anyone, if I ever run into him again, I'll tell him what an arrogant asshole and brute he is. The sun rose, and with it came the day of the game. After we woke up, my sister and I left the tent and headed to the area where the food was. When we arrived, we found bread, meat, cheese, and some varieties of fruit, placed chaotically on several rectangular wooden tables, which looked old and damaged. The tables had room for at least 20 people. We took one of the flat, dark brown ceramic plates and some wooden spoons and started to choose small pieces of meat, cheese, and bread. We tried to sit on the small logs that served as chairs, but they were all taken. In the end, we sat on the grass, away from the tables. While we were eating the remaining pieces of wild boar meat from the day before, the Viking who had been bothering us approached us. What now? I heard my sister's irritated voice. What's the matter, witch? The Viking replied with a mischievous smile. What do you want now? You don't have any other women to bother with your presence? The Viking laughed at her words. 
Someday you're gonna warm my bed. It seemed strange that this caveman should have this sudden change of mood toward Maeve. Listen carefully, because you're already bothering me. If I warm your bed, it would only be in your dreams, and be careful that I don't enter them and make you experience the pain of waking up as a eunuch. You're just a costumed, abusive, rude idiot. I may be a witch, but at least I'm not as repulsive as you, she finished, with a look so cold that it was intimidating. Is this my sister? I'd never heard her say such harsh words to anyone. For the first time, the Viking was speechless. His look was no longer that of a fool, but now it was that of someone who was feeling sorry. He stood there for a few more seconds, staring at Maeve, and then he was gone. Neither of us said anything. We just finished eating and headed to the area where Hado would gather the competitors to explain the rules of the game. The four of us were sitting at one of the tables where the food was being served, a bit away from the crowd that was waiting for the announcement about the game. From here, sitting on a log, I appreciated the costumes and styles that men and women wore. Many of the women had extravagant braided hairstyles. They looked like warriors ready for the attack. Others wore garments that highlighted their feminine attributes. Many of the men, on the other hand, were dressed in white wool tunics, a kind of leather vest, and brown leather pants. Almost all of them had part of their head shaved. I was surreptitiously trying to find that bastard from last night. As much as I told myself that it wasn't worth thinking about what that prick said to me, I couldn't stop thinking about the words I had prepared for him if I re-encountered him. My father pointed to a man who was walking in the direction of the crowd. That's Hado, he said. Hado was a handsome man. From here, I could see that there were a couple of stiff muscles and a full back under all those ridiculous medieval clothes. He was a tall man. Already in the area, Hado climbed on a keg of beer to make himself noticed. Good morning, everyone, he began. As you know, today is hunting day. Many of you already know how it works. The men must chase and hunt women. The game will last approximately four hours and will begin before the sun sets. The she-wolf who returns alone before four hours or at the end of the hunting time will win the game. When you hear the horn, it will be the signal for the women to start running. They'll have a five-minute head start. When those five minutes are up, you will hear the horn again. That's the signal for the male wolves to start hunting. Please, what a horrible game. These people are Neanderthals, and these women, how could they be part of such a thing? It's denigrating. My wolf came out. I know, right? I replied. Werewolves must remember that we no longer live in the old traditions. You will only spend one night with the woman you catch. Any use of violence against women will be punishable by immediate death. As for you women, if you enter the competition, be mindful of the consequences. Remember, you gave your consent when you signed your name. Wow, I feel better already, I thought ironically, when I heard that we didn't live in the old traditions. Now I'm going to mention the names of the women who will participate. Hatto started calling them all, while I was pouring myself some mead, which didn't taste so bad after all. Noira of the Infernal Pack, Tara of the Crimson Pack, Maeve Dollar, and Nala Dollar of the Crossbreed Land. Since everything has been explained, please prepare yourselves and head to the forest entrance and shift, Hado finished as he got off the barrel. The four of us were shocked to hear our names. No, 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 this can't be happening. There had to be a mistake. I got up without thinking twice and went to see Hado. Excuse me, but there's been a mistake, I said. What do you mean? Hado replied. We didn't sign our names. When Hado noticed my father's presence, he said, All right, come with me. Let's go see the document you signed. If the signature is not yours, you won't have to go. We nodded and followed him to his tent. When Hado took the two documents and gave them to us, he asked, Is this your signature? I didn't know what to say. It was, it was my signature, and judging by my sister's face, it was her signature too. Yes, but I didn't sign it. How could our signatures be on these documents? Look, Miss Dollar, your signatures are here. Unfortunately, I can't do anything for you. Beta Hado, my father began. It is impossible that my daughters have given their consent to this. 
Please, can you disqualify them? I'm sorry, Darius. It's the rules. Okay, so if these are the rules, we'll run away from here before the game starts. As if Hado had guessed my thoughts, he said, Don't think about running away. We have our men guarding the perimeter. Ahado, please, they're my daughters, my mother plead. Hado looked at us compassionately and sighed. I really can't do anything, Eleanor. Look, all I can tell you is that you have a witch daughter, and the other one is a wolf. Let the girls use their tricks to escape, if you know what I mean. Of course, we knew that to save ourselves from this, we had to use Maeve's powers. King Alaric It's time, Hado said. I'll be right there. Sala walked by my side until we reached the forest entrance, where the players would go hunting. Once again, she was overwhelming me with her constant attention. I tried to think about the different possibilities for how to make her understand where our relationship was not going to go. Maybe I was a bastard for not making it clear to her in the first place, but I assumed she would know. Maybe tonight, I would explain to her. I'd always thought this was an absurd and unfair game for women. So when I became king, I'd first tried to wipe out the hunt. But many of my packs were tied to the old ways, so I could only manage to alter it rather than eliminate it. After Hado had finished explaining how the game worked, he came to my tent to keep me informed about Darius's daughters. If the girls claimed they hadn't consented, how had the signatures appeared on the documents? I knew that Hado had suggested that they use spells to escape. I just hoped they wouldn't hurt anyone mortally because then we'd have a problem. It wasn't a secret to anyone that I hated witches. They were the vilest beings I'd ever met. You could never trust one because then you'd be damned. The females were standing in a line near the entrance to the forest. I stood in front of them to welcome them. All but two of them bowed their heads in submission. I assumed they were Darius's daughters. One was the witch with a delicate face and slightly dark hair, and the second was the annoying one from last night, who was watching me now with an angry expression. The woman of the pond had familiar-looking blue eyes. I remembered telling her last night that she wasn't beautiful enough to tempt me. My gaze studied every part of her figure. Even though she was not as glamorous as Sala, I could not deny that perhaps, under the fabrics that covered her nakedness, some possible round curves and breasts were waiting to be explored. She had a bold face that reflected wisdom, and her wavy hair moved freely with every gentle breeze that blew. If I had to be honest with myself, I could not deny that this strange half-breed might have enough to tempt me. The more I looked at her, the more I became uneasy and tense for some strange reason. As they all began to undress, my eyes were still on just one, the pawn's half-blood. The daughter of Darius wasn't born a witch, but in the end, she was her father's daughter. Good luck to you all, I finally said, looking at the rest of them and standing behind them. The sound of bones breaking drove me out of my thoughts. The wolf's coat of the half-blood was grayish with white specks. She was a strong-looking wolf, standing on all fours with a domineering posture. When the horn sounded, the wolves ran out with all their strength. Now all that was left was to wait. Nala I left Hato's tent, furious because I felt powerless over what was happening. My family followed me, trying to keep up with my steps. When I arrived at the tent, I was exasperated with frustration, clutching at my hair. Nala, calm down a bit, my mom said, while my father cast his spell to disguise conversation. How do you want me to calm down, mom? Do you realize I have to run with this bunch of freaks? This trip was supposed to be about relaxing, I ended, practically screaming. Keep your voice down, Nala. Who could have done this to us? We signed nothing. I was pacing back and forth frantically. I don't know, but we're going to find out, said my father. Father, how can you be so calm? Shouldn't you cast one of your spells and get us out of here? Nala, I can't do that. Hado knows you're on the list, and I can't use magic to get around it. We're in his territory. But he suggested using magic but it's so that you don't get caught during the game. Dad, this is a nightmare. How are we supposed to escape those werewolves? I am not strong enough. Don't worry, Hado allowed us to use our tricks, he said, trying to appease my anger. We're going to lose. 
We don't know this place, Dad. As much as I use my sense of smell and direction, these werewolves have been here before. They've probably hunted before. My father closed his eyes, concentrating with his palms open and whispering, Tuera vida terra toa crici sola ci arbor e revusma tabula. A small map appeared in his hand. It was yellow, like the pages of old books, little symbols and lines tracing the shapes of what appeared to be rivers, mountains, and trees were drawn in the center. The symbol of a well-drawn triangle indicated the camp. Whenever you need to go somewhere, ask the map to show you the way. Keep it with you. The map will show you the way out of the forest faster. Father looked at my sister and conjured up another spell for her. Maeve, you will be able to run fast like your sister. You two must stay together, Nala. You have the strength and agility of werewolves. It will be easier for you to fight them. Take this silver dagger for extreme cases, he pointed to Maeve. My father looked at me for a few seconds. His eyes reflected resignation. I noticed that his gaze passed from my eyes to my necklace. He said nothing. He just wished us good luck and hugged us tightly. Remember, you're Darius's daughters. No one can beat you. You're invincible. When the time came, my sister and I headed to the entrance of the forest and joined the rest of the females. When I looked at who I had in front of me, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was him, the stranger of my dreams and the bastard of the pond. All the women lowered their heads in respect for him. There was no doubt that he was none other than the Alpha King. In the sunlight, I could see that he had a wide, sharp jaw. A scar started on the temple on the left side of his face and ended on his chin. Part of it was hidden behind a scruffy beard, which gave him an even wilder appearance. He was fierce and rough-looking. This man could kill with his mere presence. Why would I have been dreaming about him? It didn't make sense. None of this made sense. Good luck to you all, the bastard said with a powerful voice. When I undressed, I felt all these eyes running over my body. Surely the perverts were sharpening their teeth just by looking at all our naked bodies. I felt eager for the moment when the damn horn was going to sound. I got into position and looked at my sister to make sure she was ready too. Neely, I called my wolf. Nala, are you ready? Yes, Nala, don't worry, we will win this. I took a deep breath and began to turn into my wolf. I held back the moans of pain for every bone that was broken. After a few seconds, I was ready, on all fours. The horn sounded and we stormed out into the woods. Nala. I ran as fast as I could. At any moment, the horn would sound a second time. Through my peripheral vision, I realized that the rest of the females were separating from each other, but Maeve was running alongside me. With every step we took, the forest awaited us with open arms, eagerly waiting for us to fall into the traps it held. The density of its green blanket obscured the surface. The sun was still out, but here, running into the heart of the forest, it was as if the shadows were coming to life. I couldn't help but shiver at one point, not when it felt as if the shadows themselves were watching over us. A thought I dismissed immediately. There were more important things to worry about. The second horn whistled. The hunt had begun. I watched Maeve, making sure she was still by my side when the first scent of one of them reached me. How could they be so quick? A howl filled the air, a sure sign that one of them had caught the scent of one of the females. I didn't know precisely how fast we were running. I couldn't think clearly. A blow to my side caught me by surprise, causing me to stagger and fall sideways against one of the trees. I immediately stood up on all fours. The wolf in front of me growled maliciously, waiting to pounce. I knew its first move would be to lunge at my neck and grab it, a sign of dominance. At the last second when, I dodged its bite. He was strong, but I was determined to get rid of him. We kept fighting, he for the power to tame me and me to run away. In a struggle with our teeth and claws, I fell backward, and at that moment, he took the opportunity to grab me by the neck. Just when I thought I had lost, my sister's voice made me look for her. Suddenly, I felt nothing. No grip around my throat. The scumbag's teeth were gone. Sorry it took me so long, but I got mine too. When I looked at Maeve again, 
I saw a wolf cub rubbing up against her legs. Let's go. We kept running for a few more long minutes. We had to stop to look at the map and keep going. We came to a narrow, rocky gorge where a small waterfall ran down. I commanded Neely to let me free. I think this place will be suitable for us to rest for a while. Maybe we can hide here and let time pass a little bit, Maeve suggested. We can't stay here that long. Any of them could smell us at some point, and it will be harder to escape. They'll be on to us in a second. With a sigh, I looked around us. We couldn't stay long in this part of the forest. It wasn't strategic, and we couldn't risk being cornered. Maeve took out the map from her little bag. Look, we have to cross this valley here to get to this river. I'd guess it's about eight miles from where we are now to the river, and then we have to go a little more than a mile to get to this strait. Shit, that's pretty far away, I said, feeling exhausted already. We laid down on the soil. I rested my bare back on one of the enormous stones covered with moss. The rays of sunlight didn't reach the ground here. The massive stone walls prevented the natural heat of the day from entering the narrow space where we were sheltering ourselves. Someone got us into this game of beasts, Maeve said. Her green eyes focused on the water running on the ground. The question is why? Who would be the target, you or me? Maeve furrowed her brow, adjusting her position at the same time. My ass is sore from sitting here. I scoffed at her last comment. Maybe it's you they want, but I get the feeling it's me. Maybe those dreams you've been having have something to do with it. Probably. My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of small branches cracking. I touched Maeve's arm at once, glancing meaningfully toward where the noise had come from. There's one nearby, I whispered. You have to move slowly and move out that way. I pointed out the tiny opening at the end of the gorge. We got up and started tiptoeing around, trying to make as low noise as possible. We had nearly reached the opening when the sound of a grunt caught our attention. A wolf with a brown coat that matched his cocoa brown eyes watched us from a slight elevation, showing his canines. When Maeve started whispering a spell, the wolf jumped toward us. Go, I shouted to Maeve, pushing her forward. We ran with the force of a hurricane, but the small rocks hidden in the stream made our passage difficult. It was impossible to be as fast in my human form as I was on all fours, but I couldn't risk turning into a wolf while someone else was chasing me at full speed. The process would only slow me down. Maeve had just managed to get through the opening when I felt the wolf's claws grabbing my leg, tearing some of the skin off. A groan of pain escaped my throat. The wolf dragged me in the opposite direction from Maeve. Without thinking, I turned around and faced him. With strength I didn't know I had, I punched him in one eye, taking advantage of his confusion. I got up and rushed toward the exit where my sister was waiting for me. Her eyes went from green to dark purple, and I could hear her voice echoing around me. The ground beneath my feet began to shake. Stones began to slide down. Hurry, Maeve implored me. Stones fell uncontrollably at my every step. The werewolf was back on its feet and on my heels. Elo terra petram solacasitora operit, I heard her cast. Maeve grabbed my arm and pulled me toward her, dropping me to the ground. The opening of the gorge was closing. The frightened wolf retreated quickly. Are you all right, Nala? My heart was pounding with the anticipation and the fear of the moment, he scratched my leg. I showed her the wound. I had the mark of his claws on my skin. Blood was running down. Well, it doesn't look like a deep wound. Can you transform? I nodded, then shifted without much effort. This time, we took a path with a more precise direction toward the valley near the eastern exit of the forest. When we reached the outskirts of the valley, I heard grunting sounds in the distance and slowed down. Maeve and I decided to walk cautiously until we reached a small, raised plain where we crouched down. I returned to my human form. Below, two wolves were fighting fiercely. The more muscular one swiped his claw at the other, which was not as big but seemed to be faster. They were a male and a female. Then the male grabbed her neck to subdue her. The weak she-wolf ducked her head and cowered in submission. We heard how their bones began to take on human form. He was handsome, but his attractiveness ended there. 
what good was beauty when you were an asshole? The two of them, naked, walked toward the trees. He was holding the woman's wrist, practically dragging her. Please, if one of them catches me, cut off his penis right away, Maeve said suddenly. You know I'd cut it off, but I know if you get caught, no one will touch you. You're a witch, aren't you? With these brute beasts, you never know. When they disappeared from our sight, we resumed running. Luckily for us, the valley was not so wide. We passed some small trees, and we finally arrived at the river. I sniffed around to see if anyone was following us. Nothing. The river is too wide. How are we going to cross it? I looked at her with my wolf eyes, waiting for the answer. The river was quite deep, and the current was constant. We could end up drowning. My ears moved as I heard what we feared most. I growled at my sister to get her to hurry up. The howling was nearby. Wait, I'm trying to remember a water spell. Another howl, this time from a different wolf. I was moving, agitated, watching nervously. Maeve was babbling incoherent words. A wolf appeared in the trees, slowly approaching. God, not again. The wolf threw himself at Maeve without a second thought. I rushed right over to block it, but a second werewolf got ahead of me and attacked the first one. Both wolves were fighting for territory. The one who seemed to be defending us had a brown coat with white spots, and with its every move and dexterity, there was no doubt that he was an alpha. Still, we couldn't just stand by and let one of them catch us. Maeve and I had the same idea at that moment, to flee. We broke into a run, though we didn't know where we were going, we couldn't cross the river. After a while, I realized we were running in circles because we were back in the same place where the first wolves wanted to catch us. We stopped dead in our tracks. Maeve pulled out the map again to look at it, and within minutes, I heard the howls of other wolves. This time, however, they were farther away. Run, run, Maeve yelled as she ran past me. We continued at full speed until we thought we'd lost the wolves. When we stopped at the foot of a kapok tree, Maeve, panting and with almost trembling hands, pulled out the sketchy map again. We have to get to this creek, cross it, and... Maeve and I looked at the trees. We couldn't see them, but we felt they were close. How come they were so fucking fast? Again, we ran at full speed as if our lives depended on it. This was true, but it wasn't really our lives we were fighting for. It was our pride. A sudden breeze lightly brushed part of the branches nearby, and the peculiar scent of one of the wolves heightened my survival instinct. They were getting closer. My sister stumbled and fell to the ground. I stopped to help her. The scent was now more intense. Grabbing her dress with my canine teeth, I helped her up, but she cried out in pain when she tried to put weight on her right foot. I shook my head to signal her to get on my back. Once she was on top of me, I continued the race this time terrified. We had lost the lead, and I kept thinking that if we didn't get away, we'd have to kill one of those barbarians if they touched us. A sudden sharp blow knocked me sideways. I saw two wolves staring at us, ready to attack. They were the strangest I had ever seen. The fur was obsidian, a black too pure to look natural, and the irises of their eyes were barely distinguishable. I felt my own eyes register their shape with curiosity and at the same time, with fear. These two did not belong to the hunt. They were the product of some kind of magic. Where was Maeve? Looking around, I saw her rise from the ground with difficulty. The impact had been worse for her. One of the wolves lunged at her, and without thinking, I blocked it, biting it just in time to stop its attack. The wolf fought back, sinking his teeth into my neck. I howled. I could feel the blood running down my fur. I was able to get out in time before his grip deepened, and with the nails of one of my front paws, I hit him in the face. The wolf retreated, and I could see the lines of black blood that spurted out near his right eye. My suspicions were confirmed. These two were not of this realm. Maeve's right arm was bleeding. She held a silver dagger pointed at the second wolf. He was toying with her viciously over and over again. My sister looked so weak, her mind probably couldn't focus on conjuring. I felt the bite, this time deeper, from the wolf I had wounded. I tried to get out of his control, lying on my back on the ground. I tried to push him away with my paws, but to no avail. 
For a moment, I wanted to give up. And just when I thought I had no more strength to push him off of me, the air suddenly changed in the forest, and a mighty growl rocked the woods. A flock of birds flew out of the trees in a state of fear. The two wolves quickly retreated as if they knew who or what was about. I regained my position on all fours and shifted with incredible difficulty. The bite on my shoulder was worse than I thought. Maeve looked at me. What was that? What's wrong with them? I looked up at the trees that were still vibrating because of the strange, scary roar. I don't know, but nothing good must come of it. Let's go. Nala. The wound the wolf had caused me made it difficult at first to transform again, but I managed to do so after a few seconds. I continued to run as before, only this time I felt a little weak, I supposed, because of the effort of running so much and the wound on my neck, which, although not so severe, hurt a lot. After hearing the grunt and having escaped from the wolves, I heard them chasing us again. This was the race of no end. That was when my sister noticed that I wasn't as fast as before. I could feel that the owner of the mighty roar was too close. It would be hard to dodge that beast. And as if Maeve had heard my thoughts, she asked me to stop. I watched as she pulled two small bottles from the bag that hung on her leather belt. Drink this, quick. I looked at her, not understanding what she was trying to accomplish. That beast is near. In the condition you're in, it will catch you without any effort. This will help you to be invisible for a few minutes. You must stay still if he's around, otherwise he'll notice. Without thinking twice, I nodded, and she poured the green liquid into my mouth. A cold feeling ran through my veins. My legs were no longer in sight. Every part of my body was disappearing. We have to split up. Don't worry, I'll distract them. Find a place to hide. I'll catch up with you later. And with that, Maeve went ahead and took the left path. Mindful of the lack of lead I had, I trotted carefully until I reached some overlapping fallen trunks, which I could climb on to reach one of the tree's thick branches. This would be the perfect hiding place. The beast roared with more fury. It was only a few steps away. With that revelation and the panic that was now overtaking my body, I rushed to my hiding spot. I had barely managed to balance myself on the tree branch when I saw the beast behind the roar. A powerful, dark-haired lichen stopped near the climb formed by the logs. The lichen inhaled deeply, as if trying to detect the scent of something, or of me. The seconds passed, and with them, worry about Maeve's potion popped into my mind. Trying to keep my legs balanced, I couldn't help but slip a bit. As I hit the sides of the thick branch, leaves fell to the ground. The lichen's eyes looked up, narrowing. He observed the direction from which the leaves were falling. He growled again and jumped onto my hiding place. Without thinking, I jumped from the tree. The sudden pain in one of my legs from the abrupt fall did not stop me. I ran as if life was being taken away from me. Hurriedly, I left the thick forest and entered a valley. I didn't know if it was part of the other one I'd been in with Maeve, or if this was a new one. The sunlight was already gone, and only the twilight remained. I looked at the horizon, and the open sea became visible. I had no other way out. The lichen's steady steps were haunting me, and I was no longer strong enough to continue. Invisibility left my body. I had to keep a cool head to think about my next move. I reached the edge of the cliff and looked down, where the rough sea was waiting for me. At least I didn't see any rocks on the surface. That was when I inhaled the most delectable aroma I'd ever smelled. It was a mixture of citrus and sandalwood. Mate, said Neely. I shifted and turned around, and I saw my mate. I saw the king and the bastard. Reality hit me. My hands went quickly to my neck to find the necklace. I was no longer wearing it. The bastard was standing in front of me in all his glory. I could not help but look at every part of his body. I was overwhelmed by the desire to want to kiss him. This was my mate. His eyes roamed over every aspect of my body, which reacted to his lust-filled gaze. Nala, our mate is so handsome. Look at those pectorals and those arms and what a- Neely. I felt flushed with what she'd been going to say. Stupid thing, because it wasn't the first time I'd seen one. 
You are my mate, a half-blood, a witch, he suddenly said in a derogatory tone. His words shocked me, and more than his words, the sound of his voice. Nala, why does he call us a witch? We are not witches, Nala. What is wrong with our mate? I heard Neely in despair. Yes, I am your mate, a half-blood, I answered him coldly. I wasn't going to lose my temper with him. My pride wouldn't let me. When he'd called me a half-blood, something in me had changed totally, from the excitement of discovering my mate to the anger and resentment I now felt toward him. I went back a few steps until I reached the edge of the cliff. His expression went from being harsh to becoming apprehensive when he noticed my movement. Come here, he said crankily. I narrowed my eyes. Hearing his deep voice made me want him even more. Witnessing his change of mood in milliseconds made me start laughing, tilting my head back. As much as he hated me for being a half-blood, he couldn't help but feel concerned about my safety. What are you laughing at? This isn't funny. Come to me now, he demanded again. I felt a liquid running down my shoulder. It was probably the blood from the wound from the bite of that wolf. The wind kept blowing my hair. I was aware that with each time the wind blew, my scent would become more apparent to him. But this man was impassive. He showed no sign of how my scent affected him. Noticing that I hadn't done what he'd asked, he said with a stern look, Half-blood, I order you to come now. You belong to me. Obey. When I heard him call me half-blood again, my resolution was made, Fuck you, I said, throwing myself into the sea. King Alaric. No, I shouted with all the strength of my lungs. I dashed to the edge of the cliff. There was no sign of her. The waves were crashing heavily against the rocks. I searched for her desperately, but there was no sign of her. A knot of pain had formed in my chest because my mate had disappeared. Deep down, something told me she wasn't dead. I felt that she was not dead because the connection was still there. Hado, I mind linked. Bring the men now, I ordered with fury. What happened? Did you find her? Yes, but she jumped off the cliff. I couldn't help but feel guilty. How? Why? Come quickly now. We have to find her. Every minute that passed increased the chance that she would be in danger. Anger filled my whole being. You're an idiot. How could you do that to our mate? My lichen was furious. Shut up, I demanded. And you had to call her a half-blood? I said shut up. I forced my lichen to the back of my mind. Earlier. I was surprised when I smelled the most exquisite aroma. It was a mixture of peonies with rain and earth. It was soft and subtly sweet. When her fragrance reached my nose, my lichen and I could not contain ourselves. I shifted and growled at everyone around me. I needed to find the owner of that scent. When I sniffed around and concentrated on smelling her, I ran into the woods like a mad man-wolf. I could only think that I had finally found my Luna, my wife, who would carry my cubs. When I reached the cliff, I saw her. There was the most beautiful she-wolf I had ever seen. But something about her was familiar. She was one of the competitors. I saw her shifting and I followed her. When she turned around in her human form, I was stunned. My mate was the blue-eyed half-blood of the pond. I felt betrayed. Here was my mate, standing in front of me. But she was half-blooded, with witch's blood. The last thing I'd imagined was this. I felt a mixture of sensations. I felt disgusted toward her. But at the same time, I felt complete with every gust of wind that blew in my direction and brought me her aroma. I felt intoxicated with her figure, with her face. I felt disappointed but happy at the same time. It was a whirlwind of emotions that were driving me crazy inside. I could smell her excitement when I couldn't stop myself from admiring her face and body, but she was the witch's daughter. I'd sworn a long time ago I'd never have anything to do with that damn species again. When I called her a half-blood, I noticed the change in her right away. The smell of her arousal was gone. I knew I was hurting her with every word, but the shock of learning that a half-blood was my mate made me say offensive words. When I saw her take a few steps back, the fear of losing her invaded my heart. 
I saw how her fleshy, shapely lips formed the most beautiful smile, a smile that could well belong to a spiteful soul like her. What are you laughing at? This is not funny. Come to me now, I ordered her with my alpha tone. She did not submit to my will. She just threw herself off the cliff, and I didn't sense fear in her eyes. I was exasperated because I did not know what to do with her. My rage and despair clouded my senses. I still couldn't believe it. This woman preferred to throw herself into the sea over coming to me, to her mate. The unexpected gust of wind alerted all my senses. The gentle smell of peonies jolted every cell of my human body. The half-blood was close, but where? I closed my eyes to focus and took a deep breath. I found you. I shifted, and I went after her. This time she wasn't going to run away from me. Nala. You're my mate? A half-blood? A witch? Half-blood, I order you to come now. You belong to me. Obey. Fuck you. The memories echoed in my mind. I felt tired. I just wanted to sleep. The distant sound of the night's owners tried to awaken my sleepy consciousness. Well done, Nala. The sound of an angelic voice led me out of my sleepy state. I saw myself lying on the mud, surrounded by green nature. Where am I? Leaning my hands in the mud, I stood up with effort. Huge trees surrounded me, and small drops of rain were falling from their branches. How did I get here? What is this place? I remembered that I'd jumped off the cliff. I remembered closing my eyes and letting gravity take over. I had been aware that my fall would not be fatal, but it would be dangerous and could leave me seriously injured. But what could I do? My mate had rejected me just because I was a half-blood. I would rather run away than give myself to him blindly because of the bond we felt. I remembered when I'd fallen, I'd closed my eyes and had seen a forest. A chilly sensation woke me up from my own thoughts. Heavy rain was pouring down from the clouds incessantly. The darkness of the night spread all over the land. Is the game over? I didn't know how long I'd been unconscious. I was confused and naked in the middle of an unfamiliar place. I didn't know if I was near the tents. What would have happened to Maeve? Would she have been caught? I decided to start walking in the direction I thought was north. My feet were sinking in the mud with every step. My body was wet with every drop that fell from the tree branches. I continued for a few more minutes, then I stopped. I was not alone. Someone was lurking in the shadows. I was scared. I didn't have the strength to keep fighting, but I had to defend myself if something attacked me. Neely? I called my she-wolf. I hadn't realized until now that she felt strange. Nala, are you okay? Neely's voice echoed in my mind. Sort of. I don't know what happened. I woke up lying in this place. We're not alone. Someone's here. Nala, I'm sorry, but I can't get out. I feel weak. Neely's thoughts disappeared. Whatever it was, I only had one option now, to run and fight for myself when the time came. Without a second thought, I was out like a bullet, shooting through the small plants growing in the wet ground. I heard a growl behind me. For a second, I thought it was my mate, but I realized that the roar was not as loud and powerful. Why would there be a werewolf here in the middle of nowhere? Maybe the hunt isn't over yet. I looked back as I ran. Indeed, a werewolf was chasing me. I knew that at any moment it would catch up with me. I kept forcing my feet to move quickly. I fell to the ground sharply, and claws pressed my body against the ground. I stayed still, waiting for its teeth to sink into my skin. However, the werewolf took its foot off my back, but I could feel it still standing on all fours above me. Not knowing what I was doing, I turned around and was left with my back to the wet ground. He had a grim and threatening expression. His yellow eyes with brown pupils were looking at me closely. He looked familiar, but with the darkness around us, it was impossible to see him well. What do you want? I said, trying to sound calm. Apparently, the wolf was irritated by my question. His expression changed from serious to grunting with his canines in sight, close to my face. I tried to avoid those teeth by turning my face to the side. My heart leapt almost out of my chest when I heard the loud barking of the wolf. He brought his face closer to mine again. Only this time, I wouldn't hide it in the mud. This time, I looked him straight in the eye. 
If I was going to die, I wasn't going to do it like a coward. What a lie I'm telling myself. The reality was that I was going to die like a coward. I didn't have the strength to defend myself. All I could do was hope for a miracle and that the wolf would give up and leave, which didn't seem likely to happen when I saw the menacing look in his eyes. When I thought the wolf had decided to attack me, a colossal beast came out of the trees and jumped on top of my killer, throwing him into one of the trees. I stood up quickly, thinking of taking advantage of the opportunity to escape again, but the beast's eyes stopped me. The creature was a different werewolf from the rest. It had sharper and more prominent ears. Although it was standing on four legs, its spine was more pronounced. Each muscle in his face was more defined, and his bloodshot eyes were fierce. This beast was a lichen, and from the strong attraction I felt toward it and the smell of sandalwood, I knew that it was none other than the Alpha King. This one I could never escape from. My killer's whimper caught my attention. He was trying to get to his feet. The lichen approached in a threatening manner, ready to tear him to pieces. The wolf, noticing him, immediately lowered his head in submission. The lycan didn't look happy. He wanted blood. Apparently in frustration, the lycan let out a thunderous growl at the wolf that was now transforming. I couldn't believe it. He was the flirty waiter at the cafe. You? I asked him in surprise, not paying attention to the lycan, who was now gazing at me. I'm sorry. I didn't realize it was you, he said in a trembling voice. No shit! You didn't know it was me? You had me cornered with your face on mine, I said, puzzled. Before the waiter answered, the sound of bones breaking caught my attention. The lichen was leaving his body to make way for the king. When my bastard mate was in his human form, he grabbed the waiter's neck and lifted him off the ground without blinking. If I ever see you again, or find out that you touch her or are near her, or look at her, or think about her, I will personally kill you with my own hands, he said in an alpha tone, clutching tightly to the throat of the waiter, who now had a bluish face. Do you understand? asked the king, tossing him hard on the ground. The waiter tried to inhale the air and nodded and started to run when another lichen caught him by the neck and released him. The frightened waiter shrank with his knees to his chest, sobbing. The lichen shifted, and Hado's human body took its place. He held on to the waiter tightly and carried him away. Now it was just the two of us. Shit. Are you crazy? He suddenly shouted at me. How could you throw yourself off the cliff? What do you care? I snarled, turning to leave, but he grabbed my wrist and pulled me toward him. I tried not to react to the sparks that ran through my body with his touch, making my skin bristle. Where do you think you're going? I'm not done talking to you. You still have to explain to me how you got here. His eyes were so fierce that I couldn't help but feel intimidated. I sighed, more because I was beginning to feel tired. I hadn't eaten for hours. My shoulder hurt where I'd been bitten. I have nothing to explain to you, I told him with a languid face. I really didn't have anything to explain to him about how I came to be here, because I honestly didn't know how or why. Those angry eyes went all the way from my eyes to my wounded shoulder. I noticed that the expression on his face relaxed, but he clenched his jaw, holding back the anger that he now felt again. Can you walk? Asked the king in a soft tone, still holding my wrist. Yes, I'm all right. Let me go, I said. I didn't have the strength to fight him. I was so tired that the only thing I wanted to do was to sleep. Come on, he said, letting go. After a few minutes of walking in silence, I asked him, where exactly are we? I looked up at him and saw his jaw tightening. We're less than a mile from the camp, he replied without looking at me. I was relieved that we didn't have to walk far. I didn't know how much longer I could stand. I was naked and covered with mud. My hair was wet from the light rain that kept falling. When I saw the campsite a few steps away, the king stopped and turned to me. I want to ask you something before we go on, he said to me in a severe tone, but I could feel a hint of hesitation. At this point, I would do whatever he asked, as long as I was on my way to sleep. 
I noticed that my eyes were closing, and I tried with the last energies to stay awake. Why am I so tired? What's the matter? Don't you want people to know I'm your mate? Not waiting for an answer, I said. You've got nothing to worry about. The first person who's not interested in anyone knowing we're mates is me. The bastard's fierce eyes turned grim. They were a red sea of fury and hungry for death. The robust and unexpected clutch of his hand on my arm made me stagger and lose my balance, falling into his rocky chest. Let me point out a few things to you, Witch. First, never pretend to know what I intend to say or what I think. Second, the fact that you are my mate does not mean that we are equals. Therefore, I hope that you cooperate with me and do not get involved in my affairs. Third, the last thing you just said, it wasn't what I was going to ask. But after hearing all those gibberish words, I now command you. First thing tomorrow morning, I want you in my castle with all your belongings. For your misery and for my displeasure, we are stuck with each other from now on. You can never get away from me and I can never get free of you. We came out of the dark forest and found several small fires where people were gathered, laughing and drinking beer from those Viking horns. When they noticed our presence, they were all silent. I could feel every scrutinizing look, surely wondering what I was doing with the king. A powerful growl came from the throat of the alpha prick bastard king, and immediately, all the males lowered their heads. The hundreds of eyes that had looked at me a few seconds ago were now staring at the ground. Of all the females who were still giving us fleeting glances, only one caught my attention. The intense, gelid gaze belonged to a woman with long, dark hair that reached to her waist. Her dark eyes passed from me to the king. She was a gorgeous woman indeed. From the way she looked at the bastard, I could tell that she knew him better than that. She was probably the girlfriend everyone was talking about. At that moment, a jealousy spike stuck in my chest. I let the king walk forward and went another way, looking for my tent. Where are you going? he said to me in an inexpressive tone. I turned around to see him and approached him. Obviously, I'm on my way to my tent. Do you require anything else? His eyes moved to my breasts and were fixed for a few seconds. Seizing the moment and knowing that several people were still looking at us, I told him, good night, bowing my head in respect as if I were one of his lackeys. His eyes jumped up in anger at mine, and before he could say anything, I turned around and went my way. Nala. I could see my parents waiting for me as I walked through the tents. My mother, with slight tears on her face, was waiting for me with open arms. All the men around me were still staring at the ground. I knew that the king was watching me. I could feel the intensity of his gaze on my body. My mother's warm embrace was all I needed. I hugged my mother once I reached my tent. Darius, find water to wash her my mother ordered. I was now sitting on the woolen sheet on the ground. I couldn't talk because I didn't know what to say. I was exhausted. My father returned a few minutes later with a wooden bucket that held the fresh water. He put it on the floor near my mother, then left. My mother tore a piece of the wool and put it in the water bucket. The soaked piece of cloth cleaning the mud from my neck forced me to note that I barely felt any pain from the bite that the wolf of the shadows had inflicted. Thanks to the moon goddess, the wound is not so deep. Hearing her say that, I looked at her and touched the wound. How was it possible that the injury was now smaller? Nala, what happened? My mother asked, stopping with the cloth in her hand. Mom, I don't know. I don't understand anything, I just want to sleep, please, I said with tearful eyes. I was frustrated, tired, disappointed, confused. My mother nodded, then finished removing the rest of the mud and helped me put on a white wool dress. I lay down and closed my eyes. I heard my mother getting up to leave, but I grabbed her hand. I didn't want to be alone. I didn't want to be alone with my tormented thoughts. I needed someone's comfort. I needed someone to comfort me and tell me that everything would be okay, no matter if it was a lie, no matter if everything would worsen the next day. I just needed a moment of peace and hope for what my life would become tomorrow, or rather, what it had become today. 
please don't leave me alone. Stay with me. She nodded and lay next to me, stroking my hair. I could finally close my eyes and sleep. The next morning, I woke up. My mother wasn't with me. I guessed she'd woken up earlier. With my eyes open, lying down and my arms crossed behind my head, I only looked at the tent ceiling. Now what? Remembering the king, an inner rage seized my whole body. I had nothing to do here. Today, I would finally leave this place, and hopefully buy the first plane ticket back home where I belonged. Nala! Maeve came in suddenly and threw herself at me, hugging me so hard she almost knocked the wind out of me. Hugging her back, I said, Sister, I'm fine, you're suffocating me. Oh, I'm sorry, Nala, I was so worried about you. Are you okay? What happened to you last night? I asked, did they catch you? My sister nodded. I opened my eyes in surprise. My poor sister. Did he force you to sleep with him? Maeve's face betrayed a half smile. What's going on here? Nala, last night was pretty strange. Tell me about it, I said. What happened to you? Everyone's commenting on you coming out of the forest with the king. There are rumors. I'll tell you later. Tell me about yourself first. I honestly didn't know where to start telling my side of the story. The pervert who grabbed me was none other than Kavan, the Viking bothering us. He's the one who saved us from that wolf in the river, remember? Really? Kavan is an alpha wolf, I said, surprised by the news. Last night, when he took me to his tent, I was ready to fight him, but he didn't do anything. He just went to sleep and asked me to stay with him until the sun rose, so everyone would think I was with him. Why did he do that? I don't know. He didn't give me any explanations, and I didn't want to hear them either. I woke up today and just thanked him. He just looked at me and nodded. Well, at least now we know that the caveman has some decency, I said, smiling, barely wanting to. Tell me now, what happened last night? What were you doing with the king? I was trying to formulate the first words. How could I explain to my sister that my mate was the king, that he'd rejected me, that I'd thrown myself from a cliff, had never reached the sea, and had appeared from nowhere in the forest, that the king had asked me, well, instead commanded me to move in with him? Where is your necklace? Maeve asked me, dumbfounded. I didn't have to answer her. Her face showed now that she'd figured it out. Don't tell me the king is your mate. Yes, I said. But when he found out it was me, he rejected me. What? She said as she stood up in anger. I stood up too. As I was about to answer her, our parents came in. Nala, how do you feel today, my child? My mother asked, hugging me and examining my body. I'm better, and I want to get out of here now. Nala, my father interrupted. We need to talk about last night. We know who your mate is. How? I said with a scowl. After you fell asleep, the king commanded my presence, said my father with his arms folded behind his back. What for? He wanted to explain that even though you are not what he expected, he is willing to accept the bond. He said that the day after tomorrow, you will live with him in his castle. My father stopped, doubting whether or not to continue. Father, I asked him, waiting for him to continue. King Alaric made clear that although he accepts the bond between you two, you will never become queen of this kingdom, and you will not be the mother of his heirs. You will only stay by his side because his instincts will not let him leave you, and his lichen will become uncontrollably murderous. Wait, he told me last night that I would have to move today, and now you are saying that it will be the day after tomorrow. Yes, that was his the first intention, but I requested for it to be the day after tomorrow. The three people that I loved more than anything else in this life were staring at me in silence. I could see the pity in their eyes. Honestly, I could have told them that the bastard's intentions hurt me deeply, that I was going to cry for an asshole who didn't want me at all and despised me for what I was. But it wasn't like that. Listening to the bastard king's plans was not like adding salt to my wound. At a certain point, I was relieved. The queen of this place? Not in a million years. To be the mother of his children? Less. 
I could never come to love, let alone respect, a man who saw me as inferior. You know what? I don't want him either. I made it very clear to him last night. It's a shame I can't formally refuse him. That was the biggest problem of all. The king couldn't accept me as his mate, but he couldn't reject me either. No alpha could reject his mate, and vice versa. It didn't matter if you said the whole sentence. You just couldn't. The connection would still be there wherever you went. Only lower-ranking werewolves could do that. So it would be him for life, and I was tied up by the stupid bond. I want to leave this place now, I said in exasperation. Okay, let's pack and leave, said my father as he left my tent. I didn't have to stay a minute longer in this annoying place next to the bastard. I couldn't stand another second here. Sandalwood's smell had been chasing me since I'd woken up, and it was getting harder for me to concentrate. After I gathered my stuff, I left the tent. The four of us were on our way toward my little four-wheeled salvation, waiting for us a few meters from the periphery of the campsite. Nala Dollar, a familiar voice called behind me. I turned around and saw Hato, the king's beta. What's going on? I asked him suspiciously. Come with me, please, Hato requested. Go with you? To where exactly? Hato gave me a look, confirming my suspicions. That damn prick. He wanted to see me. Hato, look, I don't want to be disrespectful to you, but I'm not going to see him. I turned around to leave. Please come with me. The king is commanding your presence. Why does he want to see me now? I don't know. King Alaric just asked me to find you and take you to the royal tent. Nala, I heard my father say, please go. It may be important. We'll wait for you here. After listening to my father's suggestion, I did nothing but follow Hato. When we were almost at the entrance, I hurried along without waiting for Hato to announce me. And what a surprise I got. There was the black-haired, gelid-eyed woman hanging from his neck, glued to my mate's lips. Not mate! My goodness, I have to stop thinking of him as my mate. He quickly parted from her when he noticed my presence, or rather my scent. Jealousy was eating me up inside. But what the hell is this? Is that why he called me? He wanted to rub in my face and the fact that he has someone else? I blocked all the negative thoughts. I needed to be calm. Hado told me you wanted to see me. My voice was cold. Who do you think you are to come in here unannounced and talk to the king like that? If I said before that this woman was beautiful, now I have to add that she had the most cantankerous voice I'd ever heard in my entire existence. Be careful how you talk to me. I said. Sala approached me, and with a quick movement, raised her hand to slap me. But to her disappointment, I stopped her in time by holding her wrist tight and letting go of her abruptly. Alaric, won't you do something? This half-blood must know her place, she said, walking toward him. I didn't know why I waited for him to take my side and shut her up, but he didn't. Miss Dollar, remember you must first wait to be announced before you enter and you can only speak when I say you can. Apologize to Sala now. His tone was harsh. His eyes showed irritation and his jaw was tense. I really couldn't believe the nerve of this man. At this very moment, I was going to explode with the rage I felt. This man was an asshole, and this asshole was my mate. What have I done to deserve this cruelty? Now I knew the moon goddess hated me. I glanced from one to the other. The king and Sala were waiting for my act of submission. A laugh erupted from my lips. I don't have to apologize to anyone when I'm the one who's offended, I addressed him. You, Sala began. The king raised his hand as a sign for Sala to be silent. He approached slowly and menacingly like a black panther prowling its prey. If I tell you to apologize, you just do it. Remember that I'm your alpha king, the menacing man said. For some reason, I was not intimidated by the tone he was speaking in. My alpha king, I said ironically. I don't think half-bloods have just one king or queen. If I remember correctly, my father is a witch. Our eyes locked for a few seconds. A sudden desire began to grow in my private parts. I knew he could smell it because he suddenly recoiled. If there is nothing else you need me for, then I will leave, I said, bowing my head in respect. I got out of there practically flying. 
What was that all about? Why did he call me to humiliate me in front of that stupid woman, so that I could see that he has another woman at his side? Miss Dollar, I heard Hado practically screaming at me, but I didn't stop. Leave me alone, Hado, I shouted at him. Nala. Sitting with my eyes closed in the white tub in my hotel room, I was trying to recap every single event. How was it possible that from the beginning, the Alpha King was the man I'd dreamed of? How come I'd never fallen in the water when I'd gone over the cliff? How had I ended up in the middle of the forest? Why had that black-eyed witch shown up in my dreams? I was in a maze of queries, continually looking for the answers at every crossroads. I exhaled. Hot water and bubbles covered most of my body. The image of him was haunting me again, as much as I tried to look like I was okay and didn't care about anything. I was trying to fool everyone. The truth was that I wanted him with a passion that surpassed all reason. I remembered the lines of his muscular back, the touch of his skin, his fierce eyes, and that hard jaw that beckoned my fingers to feel his stiffness. I wanted to feel him against my skin. If only he hadn't called me a half-breed with such contempt in the pond the night before, maybe I would have let it go and surrendered to his arms. But no, the scorn in his voice and in his eyes made me see reason. He was nothing but a cold man full of suspicion and hatred. He would never accept me, and I could never love a man who looked at me with contempt and disgust. Because what I felt for him at this moment was not love. It was desire, and that desire was a product of the bond we shared. Love was something that had to form and grow on its own. I was angry with myself. How could I still desire someone who despised me? I opened my eyes and rushed out of the bathroom. I had to get out of here. After dressing in suitable clothes, I went out to look for my parents. Nala, come in. My father opened his bedroom door. I liked their bedroom more than mine. This room had black wallpaper with gold figures. A gold-edged mirror hung on one of the walls. The bed was huge, with gold borders and white sheets. The small objects that decorated the place were gold and black. It was a somewhat dark room, but indeed very cozy. My mother, sitting on one of the chairs reading a book, looked up when she noticed my presence in the chamber's center. Are you all right, Nala? She asked me, closing the book. I'm fine, I think. I came because I want to leave this place as soon as possible. Nala. My mother stood up and held my hands, trying to comfort me. I don't want to stay here a minute longer. I feel like I'm going crazy with every hour that goes by, knowing the king is around, I said, walking back and forth in frustration. The king said you would move into his residence tomorrow. What did you decide to do? My mother asked with concern. I'm not going to live with him. It would be a torture. My life would become a living hell the moment I set foot in that place. Nala, come sit down here, my father asked me. I approached him with reluctance and let my body fall to his side. He took one of my hands. I can't imagine what you're feeling right now. Your suffering is breaking my heart. I just want you to know one thing. We will always be here to support you whatever you decide. But you must not be impulsive. Always think first about what you will do before making a decision. Hard as it may be to say, the king is an honorable man, but full of scars on his soul. Perhaps you can help him heal those wounds. The world is full of surprises, and maybe one day fate will reward you for what you think you've lost. Who knows if the king will realize the mistake he's making now and ask for your forgiveness one day. And he will finally accept you, and more importantly, come to love you. No, never. Not even if he begs me on his knees will I accept him. He is not worth it, nor is he worth my time, I said resolutely. Nala, the word never is dangerous, said my mother, now sitting on my other side. Nala, can you tell us exactly what happened at the hunt? My father asked. I let out a sigh. Sooner or later, I had to tell them. I started from the beginning. The wolves attacking us, the powerful growl, the necklace, the cliff. Did you jump off the cliff? Are you crazy, Nala? You could have been killed, my mother said furiously. Mother, I threw myself off the cliff, knowing that it was impossible to die. 
but I did so knowing that I would be severely injured later. But in the end, I never got to fall in the water. What are you talking about? I don't even know how to explain it myself. I just know that I woke up in the middle of a forest. I looked at my father, who hadn't said a word since I'd started telling the story. Father, how could this have happened? It was like magic. My father cast a furtive glance at my mother, who looked a little uncomfortable. What's wrong? Why don't you tell me? I asked anxiously. I wonder, I heard my father whisper to himself. Wonder what? I questioned him. He was surprised that I'd heard it and said, nothing, don't worry. Before I give you an answer, I need to know for sure what happened to you. Are you sure you don't know? Because it seems to me that you do know, I said, narrowing my eyes, suspicious that they were hiding something from me. At that moment, we heard a gentle knock on the door. When my mother opened it, the figure of Maeve entered. Nala, I was looking for you. I want to go downtown for a drink. Will you join me? Yes, of course. We went into the center of the city, which looked emptier than when I'd last been there. The heat of the sun was barely felt. Soon it would start to get dark. Walking through the narrow streets, I could see the charming, small wooden houses again. We went deeper into the heart of the old city, where the cathedral's spire stood out. It had a general Gothic appearance. I imagined that many centuries ago, it must have been the most essential part of the city, given the contrast between such a construction in the center of town and the small, not-so-ostentatious houses. We kept walking the cobblestone paths. I mentally thanked my sister for having the idea to go out. I felt more relaxed, more comfortable in my jeans and my plain black blouse. Even though the city had old buildings, it felt cozy, different from the modern human world. This kingdom had adopted certain technologies from humans, such as electric lights, hot tap water, modern kitchens and bathrooms, even specific clothing. Judging by what I saw in the ballroom the other night, they had been dressed in formal attire and gowns. From the stories my mother always told me, of the Seven Realms, this was the most modern, as the others were still living in the old ways, with horse-drawn carriages and candlelight. We sat on one of the terraces and drank mead. After talking about trivial things, we decided to walk toward the outskirts of the city. The road transformed from concrete to young, grass-covered land. Gray clouds covered most of the sky. We both went in silence, waiting for each other say the first word. The spring breeze brought the smell of rain that would soon start to descend in a few minutes. We didn't really care if it started raining. It was something that my sister and I liked. Mom told me what happened. She didn't give me as many details as I would have liked. What exactly did she tell you? She told me you came to the camp with him that night, covered in mud and blood. What really happened? My sister's voice was soft, careful not to sound pushy, waiting patiently as if she had her whole life. Where to start, I said. Start where it's least complicated and painful for you to remember. I started almost from the beginning. Every aspect of what had happened was somehow difficult to remember. Maeve waited for the story to end. When I finished talking, my senses returned to reality. We had entered a beautiful valley where high hills surrounded and protected a small village where there were at least ten houses. What wasn't quite clear was how you didn't fall in the sea and showed up elsewhere. It's like you teleported yourself. We stopped in our tracks. I don't really understand how it happened. There's no way it was me. I've never manifested any power. I remember now. When I was in the woods, I heard a familiar voice. A voice? Maeve frowned, suspicious. Yes, there was no one with me. I was all alone. Maybe my mind played a trick on me. Yeah, maybe it did. Maeve didn't seem so sure, but I didn't want to ask her what she thought the voice was. That was the least of my problems now. Something's not right about all this, Maeve continued. Yeah, I think so too. First, our names came up in the game of the hunt. Second, remember the two dark-eyed wolves that attacked us? They weren't normal. They were using some kind of magic. And finally, how come I never fell in the water? Someone's behind all of this. What I don't quite understand is what the reason would be. What's so important about us to whoever's behind all this? 
Maybe it's because the king is your mate. Think about it. The dream you had that night about the witch who told you about the necklace that masked your scent. Maybe she's behind all this. But how did she know it was you, the king's mate? We have to find out about her first. Yes, but how? Well, I'd have to go to the kingdom of witches. I know there's a place where they keep all the records of witches and wizards that have ever existed. Do you know how to get there? I don't know exactly where the realm starts. I'll talk to father about it and ask him to help me get into the archives. We'll have to find out soon. I don't think all these weird incidents are over. Whoever's behind all this isn't going to stop until they get what they want. Nala. Today was the day. He would finally come for me. I had been thinking all night about how to escape from him. My family and I had argued practically all night. They had been trying to talk some sense into me about my possible escape from the king. Apparently, it would be impossible to do so. In the end, they won. I didn't know if he would come himself to get me, most likely not. Perhaps he would find me unworthy for him to honor me with his presence. The sound of someone knocking on my door took me out of my thoughts. With reluctance, I stepped out of my comfort and went to open up. Good morning, Miss Dollar, Haddo greeted me politely. With a courteous smile and dressed in a dark blue suit, Haddo looked intimidating, capable of killing with a look from those dark eyes that promised a slow and painful death. Good morning, Haddo. What are you doing here? The lack of respect for him in my voice didn't seem to bother him. Instead, he seemed comfortable with my informality. I've come to take you to your new home. I crossed my arms and leaned my body against the frame of the entrance. Oh, and I guess the king was too busy to come in person. Hado dropped his gaze to the floor as if embarrassed by my comment. Hado, give me at least an hour to get ready. I'll wait for you at the exit. I closed the door, slid to the floor, surrendered. Last night, after so much arguing about my possible escape, I'd ended up realizing that it wasn't going to be possible. According to my father, the king would find me before I got to the nearest exit. But how would that be possible? How powerful was the king, able to track down anyone or just me? When I asked my father about how powerful the king was, he only gave me a plain answer. The king is the alpha of alphas. Of course he is the most powerful. My father was hiding something from me. I could feel it. His insistence that I should stay seemed very suspicious. My father had always supported me in my decisions and let me do what I had always believed to be right. This time, his behavior was different. I still didn't understand how, for some unknown reason, I decided to follow his advice and stay. I rose up with no other option. I prepared the little clothing I had brought on this trip. I'd never thought I'd be staying for long. Within minutes, my family was in the room with me. My mother was trying to rearrange my suitcase. My father and Maeve were silent. Well, I guess this is it, I told them. Maeve looked at me with determination. She stood up and said, I'll stay with you here, Nala. What? Maeve, are you sure? This place will be difficult for you. You know how many people hate witches here. Maeve, are you sure? My father asked. He didn't seem opposed to the idea. I will not leave her alone in this wolf's den, Maeve said. Without further words, she went to her room to collect her belongings. After a tiring exchange with Hado about my sister's decision to stay with me, Hado accepted because the king finally decided to do so. Instead, the exhausting conversation was between the king and me indirectly, through telepathic communication between the Alpha and his Beta. The king's rule number one for my sister was to stay within the castle's domains. She was forbidden to go out to the villages surrounding the king's primary residence. And of course, I had to abide by that rule too. We said goodbye to our parents amid hugs and tears. My mother, with sadness painted on her countenance, promised us that she would visit us often. When I hugged our father, I noticed that he slipped me a little note, which I immediately took without Hado noticing. So we headed for my new home, or rather, my new hell. This was how my life would be from now on. Waking up every morning in a place where neither my sister nor I would be welcome, 
a home where the man who was supposed to be my soulmate hated me. After a while, we got closer to the castle. The splendor emanating from the solid red walls surprised me again. In the light of morning, I could now admire such a fortress. Seven solid round towers dwarfed everything below them and were connected by high, thick walls made of light red stone. High windows were generously scattered around the walls in seemingly perfect symmetry, along with what appeared to be asymmetrical battlements for archers and artillery. The castle was only accessible through the bridges that connected the road with each of the entrances, as a vast and not-so-clean lake surrounded the castle. This fortress definitely reflected the personality of its owner, impenetrable and threatening. We finally made it to the entrance. The old sourpuss opened the door before Hado announced that we had arrived. Hado had probably made mental contact with him earlier. I'll help you with your belongings. Follow me, the bitter old man said to Maeve in a worn-out voice without further explanation. The tone of his voice showed his displeasure with us. Maeve turned her attention to me and said in a solemn tone, I'll look for you once we've settled down. I turned to Hado and asked him, And where will I sleep? The Alpha King wants to talk to you first. I sighed and gestured with my hand to lead the way. I followed Hado quietly. Many questions were popping into my mind, but I honestly didn't feel like starting a conversation, and I wasn't sure if Hado would answer them. I tried to call Neely in my mind, but once again, only silence was the answer. Since that night in the woods, Neely hadn't been able to surface again. I was beginning to worry, because it wasn't me who was feeling weak, but instead it was my wolf who was feeling weak. And usually, when your inner wolf was weak, your human body was vulnerable too. We stopped before some huge double doors of dark wood decorated with wolf figures made of iron. Hato opened the door and let me in first. The room was a kind of library and office. Large shelves of mahogany held hundreds and hundreds of books. A fireplace with two antique leather armchairs was placed on my left side, and dark curtains hung from the windows. A sound took me out of my appreciation for this dark but somehow inviting place. I turned to my right, where I'd thought I heard the noise. The king was standing there, dressed elegantly in black, his suit fitting like a glove. I could not deny that he was very handsome, but even if I saw him that way, it would not change my mind. He was attractive, but he was a bastard. We stared at each other for a few seconds. I started to feel tense, so I decided to break the ice. Hado said you wanted to talk about something. Yes, I imagine your father told you about my conversation with him when we were at camp. Yes, he told me, I said dryly. I was hoping to tell you personally because I think it would be the right thing to do, given the situation. I raised an eyebrow with irony. The right thing? I don't want to make this any more uncomfortable than it already is, so I'll get right to the point. I accepted that you were my mate, and that's why I brought you to live with me. Even though you have witch's blood, you know very well the feelings and desires you feel through the bond. But the fact that I accepted you as my mate doesn't mean that you will reign with me, and we will have heirs. Until I find a solution to this problem, got it. I didn't know whether to slap him, shout at him about how much I hated him, laugh at his stupidity, or cry from helplessness. Imperturbability was the emotion that finally surfaced in my voice. Is that all? I asked in the same tone. Yes. I turned to leave when his deep voice stopped me. What you saw in my tent that day. I have no need or duty to explain it to you, but I don't like misunderstandings. That kiss was not initiated by me. Sala decided to jump at the very moment you decided to enter without being announced. What you do with your life is not my problem. I should thank you, I guess, for explaining to me what happened between you and your girlfriend, but don't expect me to do the same with you. The beautifully toxic smell of his scent was taking over my body and mind just by looking at him and having him around. It took a lot of my alertness to contain the desire to throw myself at him. Fucking Bond. As I left the small private library, the same old sourpuss was waiting for me. My name is Hawes. I am the butler and caretaker of the castle's chores. Follow me. I'll show you where you'll be sleeping. 
Old Hawes had a prominent nose, which gave a more arrogant accent to his oval face. His brown eyes had a grave expression that reflected no lived joy. Hawes led me up huge stairs leading to a third floor. Steel swords and mallets hung on the walls. We entered a vast, dimly lit hallway where dark gargoyles watched us from the enormous red stone columns that reached the ceiling. We turned right into a corridor where old lamps lit the way. My room was almost at the end of it. We have arrived. Your sister's room is the second door we passed. Hawes left without saying more. I stood there for a few seconds, staring at the door. The figure of a tree with small iron branches embellished the dark and thick wood of the door. As I entered, I couldn't help but be entranced. Huge tapestries with armored bearings and golden insignias adorned the walls. Small, smiling white gargoyles were sitting in the corners at the junction of the walls and the ceiling. Sturdy, dark furniture for storing clothes was located at the back of the room. A canopy bed was situated in the center of the room against the wall. Incredibly, the sheets felt soft. I felt warmth emanating from somewhere, and looking for it, I found small lit fireplace and a cushioned chair. This place was pretty. It was sturdy somehow, but the feeling of comfort was unmistakable. It felt right.